Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the May 22nd meeting of the Blackstone Millville Regional School District School Committee. If you would please join me and stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Have an introduction of our members. When we'll start. Take Wendy time. Greenstein, Blackstone. Tammy Lemieux, Blackstone. And Jane Reggio from Millville. Jack Keith, Blackstone. Karen Vernon, Millville. Sarah Williams, Blackstone. Matt Aaronworth, Assistant <laughs> Superintendent. Jason DeFalco, Superintendent. <coughs> All right, welcome. Uh, at this time, we will entertain a, a public forum if anybody has anything they'd like to uh, share with the committee. And seeing nobody making a quick rush for the stage, well, it's not a stage, whatever, <coughs> seats, uh, we'll move to one of my favorite times of the year, sad, but favorite, um, and the recognition of our retirees. So. Thanks, Ms. Reggio. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, so nice to see everyone here. Um, as uh, Ms. Reggio said, we are uh, at a very special point in uh, the school year for the 2018-19 year, and that is to recognize and to honor our retirees uh, and all of their hard work and dedication to the BMR uh, school district uh, over many, many years. And so, uh, why don't we start with uh, Ms. Carol Brown, who started with us in 2010 and uh, has held the position of the principal of the AFM school. So Ms. Brown, if you'd like to come on up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Would you like to say a few words? Oh. <laughs> um. I'm going to try. <laughs> uh, I, <clears throat> you know, I never thought I was going to be a teacher and found that that was my calling and my passion. And, and I found myself here at Blackstone Millville. And truly, it's been an honor. I have um, met so many amazing people. And I have the pleasure of calling them my colleagues and my friends. Uh, the community is an amazing community, and I know that I'm leaving the district at a very exciting time. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that saddens me. I know there's a lot more for me to learn and experience, but I know that it's time to be with my family and be a Grammy. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's my plan. So I just want to thank everyone for the opportunity. It's truly, truly been an amazing journey for me. Great. Can you tell us about the book that you selected to be in the, the library? Well, actually, <laughs> Or you didn't? Well, I did, but okay. I did it in conjunction with Mrs. Morin. Oh, oh because I had a lot of favorites from my childhood, and I thought, well, maybe we need to move on a little bit. <laughs> so Mrs. Morin and I talked. So when we talk about her book, you'll understand okay. why I chose the one that I did. Okay, that's great. <laughs> and can I just say, add one quick thing? Um, yeah. uh, so uh, the committee might be familiar. Uh, Carrie Purcell is somebody that we're working with from Focus Schools, and. Uh, she works side by side with our, our principals, and it was really great. After uh, uh, her first couple of sessions here, she pulled me aside and said, I, I know Carol's leaving. It's unfortunate we can't get her to stay, but boy, is she going to be leaving that school in really good shape for whoever comes in next. Uh, and Carrie works with people from coast to coast and, and, and doesn't say that often. So um, nice work, Carol. Thank you so much. You'd be very missed. Oh, don't, oh, don't. Anybody have anything they'd like to say? Just thank you. Well, uh, yes, thank you. But also, I, you know, I know I, for one, always value when you come and talk to us. It has, I'm going to cry, so I won't say much, but I will say thank you very much because I think your leadership has meant the world to this place. <laughs> Carol, I just want to say thank you for, uh, you know, being a part of all three of my boys' um, experience at the AFM and the JFK. I know my oldest was extremely appreciative towards um, the time that you took with him. And, you know, she is going to be leaving 
a little bit of a hole at the AFM JFK. Um, but you always brought a positive um, touch to the school, and you show empathy towards everybody, both teachers, paras, and students. So I appreciate that. And uh, congratulations. Yeah. And enjoy your time being a grand grandma. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, You're not nearly old enough. <laughs> Uh, next, we'd like to recognize uh, Janine uh, Davia, uh, who started with us in 1987 and as a developmental learning teacher, a kindergarten teacher, and a special education teacher. So Janine could come on up. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I actually have been coming to Blackstone Mill since I was five. Wow. <laughs> I've been yeah, I went to school here, went to you know, through kindergarten to high school, had a wonderful experience there. And then I was lucky enough to get a job in the system and um it's just been great. Um I've got to work with so many kids and meet some wonderful people and um it's just been a wonderful experience and I really appreciate the opportunity to work here. Did you pick a book? I did. I picked um, Mr. Willoughby's Christmas Tree, and because uh, I did spend most of my time in kindergarten, so Christmas is a big <laughs> deal to us. <laughs> and um, it just has a great message of like sharing and caring, and like a good holiday, you know, spirit. And um, it's just and there's lots of like activities you can do with it. So uh, we don't have it in our library in Millville, so I nice. thought that maybe it would be a good addition. And Thank I you. left. <laughs> Anybody have any? I know I, for one, will miss your smiling face in the in the building. I was shocked when you left the kindergarten because you were the staple of the <laughs> kindergarten class. But I know that you've touched many lives, many of whom will graduate in a couple of weeks. So oh, they yeah. they speak it's very highly. It really anyway. has been wonderful. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Thank you. Well, congratulations and thank you so much. Thank you. We'd like to ask Diane Morin to come on up. And Diane started with the district in 1985 uh, as an elementary teacher in fourth and fifth grade and a resource room teacher. Wow, thanks, Ms. Morin. Hi. Good evening. Um, yeah, I've been with the district since 1985, and I was. I won't say my age in case there are people <laughs> <laughs> listening to me, but I was given a chance. Mm. And this is a beautiful book that says, what do you do with a chance? And I was given the chance by, and I'm going to mention a few people's names because school committees come and go, superintendents come and go. Um, I was given a chance by Mr. Fred Hotnett, who interviewed me, uh, John Pilibosian, who interviewed me, and Mr. Richard Spratt. Those are the guys that took a 20-something year old mm -hmm. and interviewed me and decided that they would take a chance on me. And my chance was to give them my gift of teaching. Mm. Pretty much that's me in a nutshell. And I have dedicated my life and my family has dedicated their lives mm -hmm. To the district. I'm also a town resident of 25 years. Wow. So um, eventually in my life, I will move away from town and maybe have some grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, I have dedicated my gift of teaching to the town of Blackstone. And we thank you. Thank you. Does anybody? Thank you. And my book, do you want to talk my book? Yeah, yeah. please. <laughs> this is not the book that I chose. Oh, that okay. I'm going to dedicate this book. Huh. And um, thanks to Fred Hartnett, John Pilibosian, and Dick Spratt for giving me the opportunity to become a Blackstone faculty member. So <clears throat> I chose The Incredible Journey, The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane by Kate DiCamillo. And Kate DiCamillo is one of the authors that we do a theme study on and also the author study on. Kate DiCamillo and The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane have been in D23 for about 16 years. So the story 
And I always had little Edward with me, who was a character from the book and a stuffed animal that went into the homes of the children of Blackstone. Unfortunately, he was naked one day on the <laughs> ship. <laughs> Two naughty little boys. But uh, the children brought the Edward home and had the opportunity to dress him in character based on Kate DiCamillo's words. Mm. So not only did Edward join us and move us through a journey in a classroom, but he also took that journey in the homes, in the lives of children. Wow. That's why I chose it. But the children chose it because we couldn't decide if we were going to choose The Wild Robot by Peter Brown, which is a new and upcoming reading loud, read aloud, and, or The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane. But they all had to write an opinion and convince me which book to choose for you this evening. So that's what the children chose pretty much oh, over nice. the years. And they had some good reasons why I should. So Carol Brown graciously took number two book <laughs> and <laughs> thought that the children of Blackstone would continue. That's a book that goes around like wildfire. Uh. And I have also made a recommendation to Wendy also. The children love it and it's on a global read aloud list. Wow, that awesome. sounds great. That's awesome. Mm. I just want to say Mrs. Morin with an M, which is what she was always referred to in my house because right. we had Mrs. Warren with a W oh. also. And so Mrs. Morin with an M um, holds, I can't do it, I'm so tired. <laughs> <laughs> um, holds a special spot in the Lemmy household. Can I will let you bring it up. You can. I'm we so can. over time. We do these things. We're ladies. We do these things. Mm -hmm. For people, we do these things. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so very much. So I don't know if you're putting plaques or what you're doing with our other books. We put a little um, plate, uh, paper, you know, the, what do you call it? Sticky them? paper. Book plate, the book plate. Yes. So do you have the, the three names? Perfect. Send that along. Okay. Names. Thank you. Okay. Oh my goodness. Thanks, Thank you. Uh, Let me next. read this before it goes into the library. Mm -hmm. uh, Dottie Santoro. Oh. Is she not here? Dottie. Oh, yeah, she's here. Yeah, there she is. Come on. Didn't see her. Uh, Dottie joined us in 1992 as a no, school. No, come on. <laughs> as a nurse at the high school and uh, at Millville Elementary. Okay. Come on. I have a problem. I have to talk to Bridget Walsh. <laughs> she made this song really easy. It's, not, it's very intense. Um, and I, can't speak with, I just can't speak. With okay. My okay. okay. Fair I enough. I can't hear it myself. Okay. So I'm going to take a spot right here. Look at Karen. Okay. <laughs> she knows me from the school. Um, I was a pediatric nurse 20 years before I came here. Wow. I've been here for 27 years. So if you do the math, you'll see that it's been a lot of years working with kids. Um, I don't say that to say pat myself on the back. However, it's just been a blessing because when you treat a child, you treat a family. And you can't because anything in a child's life is going to affect the whole family. And so it has been just such a privilege to get to know not just the children and care for them, but the families in the district. For, high school for 19 years and um, Millville for the last eight. Um, I knew this was really getting old when I'm at Millville and all the kids, a lot of the kids that had the high school were coming to with their kids. <laughs> like, oh, you were my school nurse. And it's nice when one of the guys said, gee, you look just the same. Mm. Uh, so I knew that wasn't true, but it was sweet to say so. Um, so that's, it's been a privilege. It, it's, it's just been a privilege for all these years to be involved, and uh, I'm, you know, I, it, it, there's going to be families that I'm going to keep in touch with the rest of my life because mm -hmm. they become more than just people in the school that I that I serve. Um, so, if I had, there was the book that I chose for my school is The Trumpet of the Swan. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody's read it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it is a great book. This is my copy. The cover is falling wow. apart and it's 50 years old. Wow. So um, it's been read to my kids and my grandkids. And um, I just gave it to my 60-year-old brother-in-law mm. and he couldn't put it down. And he has a degree in special ed. 
Mm -hmm. I'll just read what I wrote for this because for this because I probably won't remember what I wrote if I try to. This wonderful story teaches kids about individuality. The message that comes through says that even though no one is perfect, each person can find their own voice in the world. It's a story of disability, discouragement, disappointment, family support and pride, courage, action, honesty and redemption all achieved with the goal of rising above the circumstances and most of all love. The chapters are full of everyday settings that kids and adults alike can relate to. I read this book with my kids and twice through with the grandkids. And I, like I said, I recommended it to my, my brother-in-law who couldn't put it down. Um, and so um, thank you all. And if I had to recommend a book for the middle school, very, very similar. It's called Slider, and it's by Pete Hopeman. And again, it's about disability. It's about families working together. It's about people who think they don't have um, a talent and find out they've got the best talent of all. And anybody that works with autistic children should read Slider by mm -hmm. Pete Hopeman. And this is my choice for the um, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone? So I will tell you my experiences with Dottie. Um, first, they were, before my daughter was even in the school, I started volunteering because I thought that would be a good way to learn the school. And they used to do, and I don't know if they still do, fluoride? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, no, not now, but okay. the state stopped it. So I would go in to deliver these fluoride things to the kids. And every week, Dottie's like, they're going to be so excited. This is how we do it. And you get in the class and they're like, Bleh! But she always had a smile on her face like it was the best thing they were going to get. And then I will tell you, my family is very thankful for Dottie because I got a phone call. I think my daughter was in the second grade or so. Uh, third grade, maybe. And I got this phone call from the school nurse. And I thought, oh, God. What happened? And she pretty much told me my daughter was blind and couldn't see, couldn't see the room, couldn't see the board. She had just had a physical not very long ago, and the you know, the doctor said, Oh, everything's okay. She couldn't see at all. I mean, her glasses are like Coke bottle glasses, and it made a huge improvement in her life and our life. And you know, she's moved to contacts because, you know, 14-year-olds are vain, but mm -hmm. thank you for doing the service that you do, because it made a huge difference to us. No. Anyone else? And last but certainly not least, uh, Ms. Deb Latraverse, <coughs> who started with the district in 1985. Uh, as a paraprofessional at the elementary level. So come on up. <laughs> okay, I'm a little nervous. I have my cheat sheet. That's okay. <laughs> and um, I'm not new to two towns, one district. I grew up here, went to school here, live here, mm -hmm. and worked in the district for over half my life. Wow. And the book I chose is We're All Wonders by R.J. Palacio. And why I chose that book, it's because it teaches an important lesson about kindness and accepting others for who they really are. And it reflects my feelings for all the students that I've worked with in Blackstone and Millville throughout my years, 34 years. And I have, I'm gonna end with two quotes that are my favorite from the book. You don't have to be ordinary. Everybody wants to be seen for who they truly are. Look with kindness and you will always be wonderful. And I requested two books because I've worked in Blackstone and Millville, and students are equally as important to me. Oh. So thank you for purchasing two books for me. And I, I'm gonna place one in Millville Elementary and Blackstone. Oh, nice, very it's nice, very complex. thank you. That's it. <laughs> I have to share something, actually. When I look out and I see all the retirees that are here tonight, 
there's one thing that comes to mind, and I have to say it's building relationships with the kids that are in front of you. Um, I, I know that you are always hugging the kids, making sure that they're, you know, doing okay. <laughs> you know, I just saw Mrs. Uh, Morin at the baseball field the other day, and I, she must have had 10 students come up to her, and those are the things that kids remember. Um, you know, when a student's having a bad day and you go and you say, how are you doing today? You know, Mrs. Carroll's, no, you know, known for doing that. I mean, building relationships is something that's not measurable. It, but it does impact the students and I, I just you know I applaud you know every day that you come in and, and you build relationships with them because it's so often that they they just need that and they need to know that they're in a safe place and I I feel that everybody that's here tonight did that and you know we are so thankful for you just to do that so thank, thank you, you. Thank you. I just have to say, kind of on top it goes off of yours about the building relationships. Any time that anything happens in my house that's interesting, tomorrow I have to tell Miss Lotra first. <laughs> my Ayla. Like, I don't know if it Love actually her. makes it all the way to you because there's a gap that my it kid does. tends yes. to forget, but <laughs> she catches a fish, she has to tell Miss Lotra first. Mm -hmm anything and you know, she, a big she knows that Miss Lotraverse loves her. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, mm -hmm. most definitely. And th that's the world. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, yes, please, please do. Can I, can I just, I mean, we're just gonna pause for a second. I wanna grab a picture of the retirees if that's okay. Yeah, make you stand again. That's what he means. Yeah, <laughs> you take out flowers. Yes, please. Thank you. I hate this. I mean, I love this part, but I. Tori was still cool, Mrs. Warren, and and like, you know, she's in health services, so. Oh, she is. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all very, very much. And your families, too, because we know they're a big part of, of your commitment to our district as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to get her out too. Okay. Uh, we have. Was everybody here? That's here now. Here for the May eighth. Um, <coughs> not. Okay. So let's uh, uh, separate. There are some warrants. Um, I'll entertain a motion to approve the warrants. So moved. Second. Okay. Moved by Jack. Seconded by Wendy. Is there any discussion other than poo poo puri? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Got it, in. <laughs> I got it, in. <laughs> it wasn't me this time. All right. Uh, Jack, according to the minutes, you were here oh, on oh. May 8th. The only person, Miss Vinaco, was absent this evening, oh, according, according to the notes. All right. Well, we, we separated anyway. So we uh, had a motion by Jack, seconded by Wendy. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, abstentions. All right, minutes of the May 8th meeting. I'll entertain a motion. So move. Second. Mo moved by Wendy, seconded by Tammy. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, so moved. Uh, we will move on to our regional agreement update. Tara. Hello. So <laughs> the RFP closed Friday the 17th. And we received one proposal from the Mass Association of Regional Schools, and it was accepted. It met, met our qualifications. Met our qualifications. Thank you. So we will move forward. We're moving forward. I spoke with Stephen today, and there will, we're going to have our first meeting Tuesday, the 28th, at 530? Yeah, I think it's yeah. 530 at the high school, right? Yeah. We just have to determine the room. Um, and we'll get started with everything. Set up some future meeting dates. Plot a course of action. Right. And I know you sent that out to all the 
selected. We still need a, a Millville. You do still need a Millville representative. Millville May Board 28th? of Selectmen representative. Oh, yeah. It's May 28th before the annual Right before meeting. the meeting. Yes. I, I was like, wait, wait. <laughs> right before. <laughs> right before. We'll all be in the same night. place yeah, and yeah. then go over. Just making yeah. sure. <laughs> Make it a one big night of it. <laughs> good when it's in one so we still do need a millville board right. of select member <laughs> now are we so are we going to get a representative from the board or are we going to that is what we asked for i will follow up with that um perhaps if not perhaps maybe the town administrator or? yeah just so that we're, we have a liaison and i mean they we want them to have a voice and then we want to take our vo them to take our voice back to to the their rest town. of the board of selectmen mm -hmm. so i agree Ideally, it would be a member, but take what you can get. Mm -hmm. yeah. We'll take a member. All right. Anything else? That's good. All right. I, hope so. uh, I just wanted to let everyone know that um, the um, Student Personnel Association, what we call Unit C, did sign the memo of uh, agreement to. Um, change their um, evaluation mm -hmm. process as we had discussed in a previous meeting so that has been signed by all parties and we'll move forward immediately right and yes. what, as of what date was that signed oh, I well just because I put it back in the envelope sorry I'll you did it pretty quickly mm -hmm. yes I did it was signed on the 20th of May thank you mm-hmm And at this point, we'll move it to the report of the superintendent. Thank you again, Ms. Reggio. Uh, this evening for our, our first report, uh, we are going to hear from our building principals and assistant principals around our handbook changes. Uh, the committee did receive uh, copies of these yesterday, uh, and we will be discussing the items um, this evening uh, by uh, level. So we'll start with our elementary principals. Um, so Ms. Schaefer, Mr. Tringali, Ms. Brown, if you want to come Join us up front here. That better? Okay. That's better. <laughs> we didn't want you to see us. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to take a few minutes and um, walk us through uh, the changes and the language in the handbooks, and we can, uh, if the committee is all right with that, we can discuss that as we move through the different items. I'm not sure what level of detail you want. You know, you, you have the thing in front of you as well, right? Yes. <clears throat> Apologize for my froggy, <laughs> but <clears throat> I'll hand it off pretty quick. Um, the, the first few things are fairly obvious. You know, um, school officials, the different names and different positions. Table of contents, since we have um, some additions and deletions, we adjust the pages, obviously. And we decide, we used to have sort of an abbreviated school calendar in there. We're going to put the full-on school calendar that you approved. So it's same thing listed in multiple places. Um, and uh, throughout the, the entire document, we had a lot of references to parent slash guardian, parent slash guardian. We decided to change that to parent slash caregiver throughout the entire document. But um, one, of, one of our big things that we really addressed was absences and attendance. And um, we did this in con conjunction with the secondary principals as well, because we realized that elementary is where a lot of the families begin. So we have to sort of set the tone. And that would sort of follow through and connect through to the middle, through to the high school. Um, their perspective is a little bit different at the secondary in terms of some things. But we felt we had to set the, uh, set the tone kind of at the elementary level. Um, we want to talk about where we want with the so attendance. So is, is the attendance the same thing throughout all three levels? For the most, it's very similar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we actually referred to Mass General Law mm -hmm. yeah. um, mm -hmm. and School Committee Policy. Yep. Um, so we changed a lot of our wording. Um, <clears throat> We also made sure that the calling numbers were there, yeah, just in that's case. That's nice. I like that. Um, you don't have to look so around. that both schools are in there and um, set to go. 
and um, we also put made a point to put in in the notes that you know we will be if we can't get in touch with if you don't call in and we can't get in touch with you we're going to be notifying you know potentially the school right. resource officer or the police department to check in because we need to know that you're safe God forbid right. a carbon monoxide did something happened in your house and who knows but um, at yeah. least we know that they're safe so we made sure we put that in there as well the on that first page right under attendance mm -hmm. it says regular school attendance is defined as four absences I think we're missing some words so regular school attendance is de de defined as missing no more than four excuse that I mean because <laughs> if regular attendance is defined as missing four days that then <laughs> okay you have a lot of regular <laughs> attendance but it wouldn't be good so you're saying yeah you're right good point Good point. Not missing more than or something. Yeah, I think that's yeah. what I just think there's yeah. There's Three of us looked at that. Yeah, no one caught not that. Missing more <laughs> than or missing no more than or some some something. Okay. Um, so then a lot of it's just kind of bullet points, and then we also this this year outlined specific. If you go down the second page, um, excused absences. And that is similar among both levels, so that we have the same. You know, you're not getting one excused in one level and one unexcused, one excused in another level. And again, these are all in master law as well. Mm -hmm. And we talk about excused absences. A lot of the families thought if they called in, parent calling in, that made it an excused absence. Mm -hmm. But we just sort of defined it very crystal clear right here. Um, medically documented illness or injury seen by a physician you can't just say well he fell off his scooter and he hurt his knee you know needs to be seen by a physician bereavement family funeral major religious observation observances <coughs> sorry court date out school suspensions and other severe family circumstances at the discretion of the principal and one thing we added next to medically documented um, we've been seeing a lot of um, the parent called and said that the child was out of school today so now <coughs> it has to be to be excused you have to be seen by the medical professional. So that was um, one thing that we did also add in. Yeah, um, Ms. Schaefer, do you mean the, doc the, the doctor's office calling and saying the parent called and said? Oh, we've gotten recently doctor's notes that says the parent called my office and they said their kid was out sick, so please excuse them for these days. <laughs> but they didn't see the child? No. Okay. <laughs> but, it, but if a child has a cold, sore throat, they stay home for a day, they don't go to a doctor, but right. they don't. Sure. They, that's unexcused, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but but you have four, so you think. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah. like so, yeah. you could no, have no, no. four of those yeah. in a, you know. Yeah, I would assume after two days, if your child still yeah. has something, right. you're going to go to the doctor. I mean, <laughs> and then that, that's four three, in a trimester, so they have twelve. Well, that's right. Yeah, they have twelve. Yeah, yeah that's one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that that was the question that I had. Is yeah. you know what is excused, and I mean you definitely you, have it clearly defined. Yeah. That is the new things. I know at the, at the secondary level, they've mentioned that they've seen the same notices from the doctor yes. saying yeah. that the parent called the doctor's office um, and didn't do that. See, they didn't see the, the child. So. Well, and I think it's important to note the expectation is the child's here every day. Right. Right. We have 180 right. days and that's it. But there are reasons, as you mentioned, you know, that the child can't be. And, you right. know, and there's, a, there's opportunity for that. But there have been situations where, where, um, students uh, and or families will see the unexcused days as um, a benefit mm -hmm. and they're going to take them mm -hmm. and so they'll take them right till on every quarter right to the max more so at the high school but um, we need to get ahead of that and address that we need we can't teach empty seats mm -hmm. so we need the kids in front of us and one other piece was that if a student has missed five, has five or more unexcused days in a school year, we'll have just a meeting with the parents just more to see how can we support you? Is there more going on than just illnesses? Um, you know, is there a school or is there trouble in school? So we want to try to get ahead of that. Um, so. I think it's good. So I, I guess you know that the bottom line is that we're not trying to be punitive here. Right. Right. Um, but there, there is no substitute for having a student in a in classroom. classroom. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and I think that sometimes parents, you know, and report cards reflect the students are, are doing well. Um, and you may not see those gaps immediately, but they add up. Those absences add up. So we just, we just want families to know that we want their children with us every day and that we're willing to work with them <coughs> and um, provide whatever support we can to make sure that they're with us.
We did add a tardy policy because our handbook did not have anything about a tardy policy, so we just defined out the times um, that students considered tardy. So the parents are aware of that. And again, that's the same thing. We have the four times in a trimester um, policy, added that to that handbook as well. Then we kind of went on to family vacations. Unfortunately, we do have families that take vacations during the school year. Um, they have the, the calendar, that's why we have it right up in the front. They, they know right now for next year's vacation, so hopefully they'll, they'll book their vacations accordingly. But we still do get occasionally families that take vacation during the school year. And um, we get a lot of phone calls from parents saying, well, can we have the work ahead of time? And we explain this details that the work will not be given ahead of time. It basically will be collected and given to the student when they return. Mm -hmm. And if they're off for five days, they have five days to make it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like but, that. But again, so much of what we do is hands-on mm -hmm. and group learning, things like that. It's not reflected in a stack of papers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they miss so much when they're not in school. Mm -hmm. But parents, are, well, they'll just do the worksheets. We don't do lots of worksheets. So you're missing a huge percentage of what we do by being out. So, so when you see the, the work that's reflected, it's not really reflected what actually went on in the classroom during the, the absence. So it's just not the same. And not right. only missing the teacher instruction, but you're missing yeah. the peer interaction mm -hmm. right. in, in the cooperative learning that's happening as well. So. I think we're going to see a, a spike in this this year because Rhode Island and Massachusetts are not aligned for their April vacation. So mm -hmm. any teachers that are in Rhode Island, no vacation depending maybe. on how much mm -hmm. they value their kids' education. Mm -hmm. Um, so moving on to program of studies, um, what we did was we um, have included a link in the handbook so that it can take parents right to the DESI website so that they can take a look at the program of studies. Um, we we wanted to um, we wanted to let parents know that um, our curriculum is really fluid and we're constantly looking at that. We're in the process of curriculum review, so. It's important for them to know that what they see in the handbook um, will be changing as we go through those review processes. And, and it's an excellent resource for them to look and, and know exactly what it is we are responsible for teaching their children. And <clears throat> that changes as time goes on. The state's always changing uh, what it is we're required to teach. So um, we just want to reflect that in the handbook. Um, we also had worked on updating our report cards, so we needed to make that change in the handbook as well. Um, so we, we changed the uh, performance levels to, um, or the academic standards, <clears throat> to a 4, 3, 2, 1 scale and not addressed at this time. So I have a question about the number 1 scale. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's and I I understand what you're trying to say. I'm not sure um, a parent reading this, especially it, with a younger child not familiar with the lingo, knows what student learning is facilitated even means. Right. So um, teachers, you know, the expectation is that during Meet the Teacher Night, there's a conversation, especially during uh, report card conference time. That's when teachers have the opportunity to talk about this with parents because it may look very, it will look very differently depending upon the grade level. And so the expectation is that teachers will be communicating that to parents so that they have a deeper level of understanding. Could you help me get a deeper understanding? Yeah, sure. What are you asking basically? What, 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 is what, is, what, what does is, that mean? What so if my mean? student gets a one and not necessarily not meeting the standard, their learning is facilitated, what are you trying to tell me? You mean you're or so reteaching is required? Yes, a lot it, more support. It can be re, it can be reteaching. It can be those guiding questions, mm -hmm. so that they are requiring support to meet the standard. Mm -hmm. They are not doing it independently. Does maybe this maybe that's how yeah, you want to say it? Yeah, they're they're not, not working doing, independently. Yeah, not working independently. In, incapable of doing like this that. independently. Well, no, I want to say capable say because I think yeah. all kids are okay. Right. So you're saying yeah. Not, well, I, and I don't I. It's, it, seems to, it seems to me to target a particular group of students. It seems to me. So this language was taking right from the report card, so that's why we put that in. Yeah. So I, I guess my 
special ed when I read this my special education teacher came out in me and so in my mind I thought Johnny has an IEP he gets these accommodations we're using these accommodations and therefore he can't get a two because he used his IEP accommodations and there was some facilitation happening how does Johnny ever break the cycle I, I, I think with regard to that we need to look at the individual students because what might be independent for me is not necessarily independent for another student so you're right there may be accommodations in place to support a student to be successful um, so I, I think it's it's difficult when you take this as a blanket statement that that holds true it's not really a black and white statement and I don't know how you come up with a statement that would hold true for all students because there are students you're right who need that additional support but they are successful in achieving mm -hmm. whatever that goal is through that support so and the other piece I want to add is they'll also, they also get progress reports during that that trimester or each trimester the report cards come out so the parent, the special ed teachers can communicate that information with the parents through that as well yeah just a clarifying question it was there a so I understand the intent of that kind of framing that language but is there a reason that we we just wouldn't have students are not meeting the standard at, you know for this reporting period because my sense is if you are working with the appropriate accommodations and modifications to your work you should be making progress towards that standard right I mean we, we would we would we would hope that progress is being made so I guess I'm wondering if that's necessary student learning is facilitated so yeah, I, I, I agree. We got I, that from the I'd like to see that. Mm -hmm. the report card, we, when we the report card committee yeah. did yeah. this, and we, I, we <coughs> got examples from a bunch of schools. I can't remember exactly which school that we got this one from, and we used it and tweaked for the reporting standard. We added that on ours. Um, so we got word from, from <coughs> some schools and tweaked them a little bit to help us. And that's, I just can't remember which one we got that one from. <coughs> that's something that shouldn't be in the scale like if that's yeah, something meeting, that you want to put a note towards. about I guess the I guess so. I guess how I see it is so as a special educator I provide direct instruction through the learning process and then when I provide it, an evaluation or an assessment the student gets the accommodations but he or she completes it on his own in order to have a true representation of what that student can do so if there is a higher level of guidance throughout the the assessment is it really assessing the students ability anyway mm -hmm. you're then assessing the teachers ability to prompt them to get the right answer so do they take home a, f a, a, a paper with with a four but it's facilitated so you get a one I, I guess you know I don't know we used to have below standards so maybe right. we go back and read <laughs> what's wording? the parent feedback have you this has been yeah. used no, yes twice. yes no, no. Okay. The, there's not been no, just curious and I didn't notice like it the first time around we apparently. worked um, we worked with the report card committee for probably a year and a half yeah I remember I, um, so yeah. I remember yeah. you yeah. bringing it back yeah. uh, so I mean there, there was there was that. a lot of conversation <laughs> across all grade levels and um, you know this is this is what they mm -hmm. they had um, expressed that they had wanted to see on the report card and this is uh, there's actually the, the only part that makes it confusing is um, student learning is facilitated because that's an action mm -hmm. that's happening in a standard where the other ones don't have actions attached to it mm -hmm. so if you just took that one piece out and left it at not meeting the standard mm -hmm. right. you can have you can say anywhere in your comment section right. about the facilitation part of it right. but if you have four three two one and there's no action mm -hmm. that's attached to those four three two ones why would there be an action attached to one so could we say um, this is I, I, I like I like the idea of putting that word independently in there though independently but not meeting 
but that's that's the standard itself is that right. they have to independently be able to meet them so mm-hmm. it, okay. although it okay you okay. know what i mean like even if even a five or a four it's the expectation for the that doe they, that they they have to access that independently so if you're not okay. meeting the standards so the expectation is that not that through all of these that's independent that, correct in, it, ha- independent. it has to be independent yeah. unless okay. there's accommodations in place which will be reflected on the um progress, report, the progress or comments report. Or and use the narrative to respond sure. to if the, we just, yeah, the support. If we just took out student, student learning as facilitated, take that out and just leave it just as read. not meeting yeah. yeah. the standard. Yep. For this reporting yeah. period. Okay. Mm-hmm. Could, okay. I, mm-hmm. could, could I, is it possible to just, I see Jill back there, her little head over the podium. Is it, I mean, do you have an opinion on that facilitated? I think you might have to come forward because yeah, the people so can't hear you. Mm-hmm. So, I, I'm just curious your special ed lens. So I just actually went to a legal conference, and this is one of the things that was discussed, that on report cards, um, we can, it should be identified if the curriculum is modified. So a parent can understand mm-hmm. that they're making gains in progress in a modified curriculum. So I can go back for all the information I just had and share it, but there, there are ways it should be. You know, the attorney that spoke said we should be very clear do you know what I mean? We're presenting information to parents, and uh, and I understand parents know their children are on IEPs, and I understand there's goals and objectives and accommodations and modifications. However, when you get a report card home and it's giving you a grade, it, it may not truly reflect. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? How the student is doing in the general curriculum, but mm-hmm. more in a modified curriculum. So, like I said, I just attended a conference but, that had that. But would the suggestion be that there would be some type of comment? Or a little notation. Or a notation. Right. Modified. And that's fine because I would argue that's the, I would argue, mm-hmm. Jill, that yeah. when you provide accommodations or modifications, mm-hmm. whatever you th- deem necessary per the IEP, you might be getting a three with some facilitation. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. It depends. And so I think the note, that note is a good thing. I, I just don't think it always only applies to one, right. to so the one level. But the, my, under, this, my belief is when we're looking at accommodations, those aren't things that are supposed to change mm-hmm. the requirement. Right. It's just supposed to you know, prevent, to knock down some of those barriers for, for mm-hmm. accommodation. Mm-hmm. You should be able to grade a student on that. However, when we're providing modifications, we're changing. Mm-hmm. If mm-hmm. you're making a modification in content and it says it on the IEP, you may not be mm-hmm. meeting all those expectations. Mm-hmm. Right. You are changing the curriculum. So mm-hmm. if it's a modification, they may no. not. Now, not every single IP has a modification right. content. No, right. but Isn't some it usually? do, or you may have specialized programs where there's a different focus for students. Mm-hmm. So if we're going to be using that report card, I think we need to be very upfront, honest, and it needs to really represent what that child is doing mm-hmm. if it's modified. So, so I don't mind checking in all the documentation. I, like I said, I just attended it a week ago, and that was one of the hot topics, because schools are like, we have these report cards. I even started in high school. We have these report cards. And the attorney also gave examples how you can um, without saying this is a special education class, but you know it needs to also reflect that if a student's getting an A in this class and it's transition skills or vocational mm-hmm. skill, it is a little bit different. Mm-hmm. It's not the standard curriculum. Right. I mean, that's important because your, your qualification says that student has a disability that's significantly impacting the educational performance. So if you're presenting a report card with fours across the board, where's the impact oh well by the way he's doing a total different curriculum from right. sarah right yeah. and christina is right that students in special ed also get progress reports with their mm-hmm. report cards right right that outlines all that but you know if you just look at that report card right. it's really not giving you a, a so i don't mind getting more information about that mm-hmm. i'm not sure exactly when you want to finalize that well I, to it, make sure it sounds like if we take it out and then put the note as Notations. noted <laughs> Have it should work. Yeah. I know in Millville, I've worked with one of the special education teachers, and we used to write for kids that we modified their curriculum. We would write in the common box, you know, yeah. grades reflect yeah. the curriculum yeah. right mm-hmm. there in the classroom. But I, I think that's going to take education and practice for consistency across the yeah. elementaries um, because some might do it, some might not do it, some might it's say, the it, it, there, <laughs> there needs to be consistency on that. If, yeah. and, and, you know, I agree. I think if we took that out and, and, we reassure mm-hmm. that there's going to be some type of language attached to yeah. and any. I can find out right. that the most yeah. what the language. Right. I, I just think it's important to be consistent throughout the district sure. on that particular. Yep. And we can develop that common language and then work through the okay. classroom teacher and the special ed teachers mm-hmm. to ensure that that great. language gets in. Sorry, you missed it the first time. <laughs>
Okay. Yeah. So, so the agreement then is to remove that student learning is facilitated, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. So we'll need to make that change through um, Aspen. Yeah. So, and I'm not quite sure when that can happen. When it happens. Yeah. I yeah. Think, yeah. Yeah. We're, I, we won't be able to do it for this trimester. We'll have to do it for next year. For next year. Mm -hmm. yep. I think yeah. that we were told any changes for next year's report card needs to be in May. So we'll just yeah. have to get yeah. those in. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No problem. Okay. All right. Thank you. And then the rest of the changes were just um, housekeeping, minor, housekeeping yeah, minor numbers page numbers and that sort of bullets, that sort of thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Uh, next up, we have our middle school team, uh, Ms. Kurt and Dr. Laporte. If you want to come and I didn't see GM back highlight the changes for us. Good evening. Good evening. Hello. Ours will be a little less because um, so for the attendance and then that will cut down the high school a little as well. We, we worked as a leadership team to work on the attendance. So where the elementary said four times during a trimester, we made sure it equaled out. So middle school and the high school, it says three times during a quarter. So in the end, it's 12 days for everybody no matter if it was a quarter or a trimester yep. for under attendance. Um, tardy, I can see that. And the tardies, we changed to two. Um, we changed it as well. And then for excused absences, we oh, all had something tardy. a little different. And so we also have the exact same thing as the elementary level. And at the very top of the, the back of the second page where it's um, the school attendance policy, talking about mass general law and stuff, mm -hmm. we didn't have that. So we were wanting to add similar in. language to what the elementary and the high school had. Um, if you just go back to the front page, I kind of skipped ahead with the attendance. Um, underneath academic regulations, all we had was a rotating schedule, which actually was inaccurate for this past year. And it's not really needed because in the agenda, what we provide is a blank, blank canvas for the students to put. And so they'll be able to put down what the rotation of the classes are at that time. <coughs> the next law thing that we did was with behavior um, codes is that we wanted to add without adult approval because else where in the handbook it says that students could use cell phones in the class with teacher permission, but it wasn't really noted in the grid. And then we also wanted to add misuse of Chromebook technology. So we have it in one spot, but we didn't really have it in the grid to point it out more. And I felt it kind of got lost in the handbook. <coughs> May I ask about the consequence there? The mobile, um, the Chromebook will be confiscated. Mm -hmm. If, if teachers are using Chromebooks for teaching, does that not take away access to the curriculum if you're taking away the Chromebook during when the teacher's using it to teach? Not necessarily because they can provide a paper copy and we're finding that more and more <clears throat> when students are misusing the Chromebook to provide paper copies. So they are still getting the uh, materials that they need, but they're not accessing the Chromebook for the misuse that they're doing on the Chromebook. Gotcha. So, okay, I mean, my, in my school, we're using videos, we're using clips of things, we're using that within our Chromebook. That's not accessible on paper. So I think we just so, need to be careful about that. So I do that as That's well. That's part of our teaching. But I can also screen, I can also put it up on a big screen if I had to, too. You can also. Sure, you could do that. In, you could also have a in partnership. In general, but yeah. you have and to have think them about watch. that when you take away you the could, kids' you Chromebook. You could, have them. You could have a partnership and have them watch. Have them I've been watch. doing that as well. Yeah. Okay. Just because it's so, or I haven't have five of them sit right in front of me where I can see the screens but yeah. I mean there's definitely there's options yeah which they find ways to get around <laughs> I just want teachers to be aware of that thought process if you're using it for teaching you have to be careful a plan B plan mm. B right mm. the next one is we wanted to just separate out the word vandalism because it was Put in there with stealing and possession of a stolen item and then vandalism didn't really seem to be the same behavior 
Um, and then I do want to speak on the vaping for the work we do. In school suspension. You want to skip over that because that's way over here. Okay, so on, down on page 13, we wanted to have separate out. We had electronic and e-cigarettes and vaping. All of that was kind of meshed in with alcohol, possession of alcohol um, and drugs. And we've been doing a lot of work at the middle school and secondary level around vaping and trying to not have students doing that. And so we wanted to separate that out. We also want to give a lot of credit to our school nurses at both the high school and the middle school. They've worked tirelessly to research a lot of articles, programs, for diversion programs, and we have implemented these programs in place at the middle school level, and I believe at the high school, your first offense, you have to watch some videos, answer some um, questionnaires for three days. You're, you're given so many each day. Um, the second time you get caught, you get a more intensive program where there's Actually, they, it's called the Aspire program, where they go in and there's eight modules that they have to watch. And inside those modules are mini lessons, where it goes into a lot more in-depth programming. And there's even a link where, um, with parent permission, they have access to like a call line when they're feeling the need to do it. Um, it's almost like a hotline. Hmm. And parents sign off on that. So we're, we are trying to really stop this because we're seeing that it's become quite prevalent at our levels. So we wanted to make sure that we have that in there about, we're just calling it a vaping <coughs> diversion program. We don't want to specifically say the program we're using right now because it's free. And I don't know if it will continue to be free. <laughs> so. Is the for for the alcohol? Okay. It was alcohol, powdered alcohol. So that separated out, but then it lost its third consequence. No, so are we hoping? Oh, it, you have to go to the next. Oh, the page. next yeah. page. Sorry. But it's no. I'm still. Not. It lost the third consequence. Uh, uh, it's not numbered. Yeah, it should just say suspension. Police would be notified. For the so second. on the third. On um, so on the. I don't, Page, it says page 13 on the top of one where you separate it out and there's expulsion in the third consequence and it says separate, remove expulsion. Right. It would probably Is that removing the expulsion from both alcohol right, and electronic cigarettes? Correct. We've not done that with any of students. Yeah, so expulsion, really to... expulsion needs to be removed from all of our language. Yep. It's against uh, chapter 222. Yeah, it's against our regs. We don't expel them. Well, but we them. didn't remove it from the rest, which was my point. I was going, my next question was going to be, can we even expel people no. anymore? So we have to remove <laughs> it. We have to remove that word from all of our handbooks. So my, so then my question is on the behavior of alcohol on the third time, there's no consequence listed anymore. So is the, the most we can do is suspension? Correct. Ever. Yeah, yeah we can't. We wouldn't. We would never expel. Uh, we no, no, I, I, right. But we will just we'll copy that language from column two into three. I mean, we're well. hoping students don't get to the third time with alcohol. <laughs> but but those are as but a those side are, note. And I just want to <clears throat> clarify with this with um, Tanya and Jan. Those are consequences. Those are not the interventions that we would put in place. If we have a child who is caught drinking alcohol, there would be obviously the consequence, but there'd also be. Um, uh, my sense is a significant intervention to address the both at middle and high school level uh, to address the you know the, the alcohol use. I don't know if you want to speak to any of that. <coughs> yeah, would there be an Similar equivalent to, to the, the vaping, vaping diversion, diversion program for yeah. alcohol and drugs? Well, or? at the middle school, we haven't really had a serious problem with alcohol. We've mm -hmm. had one instance this year, um, and mm -hmm. we had counseling involved. We've had yep. parents. We've notified you know Department of children and families mm -hmm. just because we were concerned about things. So there are a lot of things that we do. We just don't always write it in here. Yeah, well, and these, well I guess that was just my point. Mm -hmm. that, you know, these are consequences you've outlined, but I, I, I brought that up specifically because I know that example, and you did put a series of interventions in place for that youngster to address the issue. So in the stealing, to, so to Tammy's point, in the stealing and vandalism, we have to take out the expulsion as well. I can, I can, I can, we can go through and make sure those are out in all of them. Yeah. 
Um, I don't know that I should bring this up on camera, but it is bugging me. What is powdered alcohol? Is it, we had to Google it. It does exist. It does? But I, I don't know. <laughs> Mr. Ducharme knows Something about it. Something tells me that Mr. Ducharme <laughs> Mr. will explain Mr. Ducharme knows a little bit more about it. <laughs> it was prevalent more like five or six years ago. Yeah. It's actually oh. like, you know how you get those like tea packets, you put them in water? It's the same thing. Huh? Hmm. <coughs> oh, no. Beer in a packet. Alcohol content, but it is, they, they have, yeah, they have, have but that. like, and, you know, all the fruity kind of stuff. Huh. Oh, no. It's just the same stuff you can buy in the bottles for already pre based. They just kind of pack it. Haven't already. And it has the alcohol. Who oh, no. knew? Learned something new. Knock on wood, we haven't had any. Don't do that at school. <clears throat> <laughs> okay. Uh, moving on. Um, from page 17 <clears throat> under cafeteria. Um, it had talked about remo removal of it, but we didn't talk. So a lot of students carry water bottles throughout the day, but it was never really anywhere in the handbook except about not taking stuff from the cafeteria. So we changed that to be open food out of the, out of the cafeteria. And down you'll see under where it said, note, we're a healthy school, no gum and candy during school day. We just put a new thing that says food and beverage and that there's no gum during the school day. Water is water only in a non-glass container. And then some teachers do allow snacks depending on <coughs> when our lunches are. So we said allergy friendly snacks at the teacher discretion. Um, for textbooks and materials, we had, I'd looked at what some of the things that they have in the high school handbook and uh, Mr. Dudek and Mr. Ducharm were adding Chromebooks under lost books, school equipment, and then had the line about vandalism of school property, which we didn't have, so we wanted to add that. Um, under technology use, some of this already came to you when we went to the one-to-one -one and I presented in front of you, so we wanted to just bullet out those two sentences to make note of how to take care of the Chromebook. Um, but we would like to not do the change on the last page. So, because it says consequence of misuse and what we were trying to do is take those offenses, put them in the grid, but we'd rather keep them in both spots. So okay. if we can not, we won't delete them there. Okay. And then we also wanted to add on technology use, just this, this stuff all came um, from having them now and seeing the uh, stuff that comes with the Chromebook use. So just some general, care, cleaning, and general use of the Chromebook. This is what students are already doing, but for every time there's new students, this way they know exactly what to do if it's lost damage, where to go, and what happens with loaner Chromebooks. And we set that up. Mrs. Tasker met with, um, like, who's that library? Ursula. Ursula. Ursula Hunt. And so mm. the whole same protocol they use at the high school, we're doing it here how to get a Chromebook, how to go and get help with it um, if something happened to it so that the students are used to the same <coughs> thing when they get to the high school. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, Mr. Dudek and Mr. Ducharme from the high school. Everybody. Good evening. So um, I just wanted to make some clarifying points with the first page. Um, reviewing it again, I, I just wanted to make sure that everyone was clear on this because it's not in the handbook. Um, we just changed. Well, it's in the handbook, but we we didn't extend on on the sentences. So if you look at page twenty. The graduation and promotion requirements, it says for graduation purposes, students earning 25.5 or more, and we change that to 26. That's not a graduation requirement. Our minimum graduation requirement is 24 credits. This is a recognition at senior awards night. Um, we have several students that take above and beyond the 24 credits, um, but we, it's, 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 it's extended to, um, almost more than 60% of our kids are doing that. So we just added a 0.5 credit to that to make it to 26. But that was just the point of clarity. Um, Mr. Ducharme said, that's not our graduation requirement, 26. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, reading it that way, 
I, I just needed to put uh, to be clear on that. Um, the second point of clarity is when we look at our high honors requirements and honor roll requirements, we've gone back and forth in terms of what our honor roll requirements are. Um, and I think the, um, the, the, the point that um, a lot of our students and parents are, are a little concerned with is the AP level classes that our kids are taking. So at one point it was, um, you know, students had to have a 90, overall average of a 90 with nothing below an 85. And student, uh, parents would go and say, well, my, my son or daughter is taking four AP level classes. They have a 78 in AP Cal and a 79 in physics, but they're not on the honor roll. How is that fair? So we looked at um, how we could make that a little um, more fair. Um, and so we changed that. But when you look at the changes on uh, the original page, it says minimum average of 90 with no more than one grade below 80. Um, what it, the intent is to say minimum average of 90 with no grade below 80. So we, we lowered that, um, that standard a little bit um, to accommodate the AP. Um, but also being able to code that in our X2. Um, but it, it then lowers the requirement for everyone. It does. So, so, so our concern is that right now we I, have, I we have an administrative placement. assistant that needs to go in and manually look at every transcript to identify any AP level class to see who has a grade in between an 80 and a 75 in order to put them back onto uh, the honor roll. Um, and that's just, it's time consuming um, to be able to do that. There's no um, code that you can go and just code out advanced placement at 75 or below, or below 80. Um, so we decided just to go and make it um, with no grade below 80. So, when was, I'm sorry, go ahead. When was the last time this was changed? Because I feel like maybe five years ago this was changed to lower it already. It was. It was. So now it's lowered again. Um, well, at one point, uh, I don't know how many years ago, the, the average was, well, we changed it to um, uh, high honors was a minimum average of 90. Right. I, I'm just um, starting we Actually, to at one point, we, we made it higher, mm -hmm. and then we made it lower for the AP, but not the... So grade point average is determined on a, a hundred scale. There's no grade, there's no like... Grade point average is a, it's a weighted GPA based off of the level or the course that they're taking. So aren't they, so, so isn't, so somebody with a 90 in an advanced placement, that's not weighted? Mm -hmm. um, the 90 is not weighted. The, 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 the 90 is not, but when we look at ranking placement, yeah. and placement, right. that's yeah. what's weighted. The computation of the GPA, it gets right. there's so a weight in we, there. Couldn't we determine honors based on GPA as opposed to based on 80, 90, 100? Because then AP would be weighted. Well, you can't do that because the GPA is cumulative of the year before. So you might have had a bad freshman year, but you're having a great sophomore year. No, but you can do you it, can by do it by semester. You can do grade by quarter. You could do a GPA by quarter. And then it would be weighted. If I just, you're in I just get. I, I'm concerned. I'm just concerned about this getting lower and lower in our right. expectations. That that's all I'm saying. And when I, I look at the um, the honor roll changes, right. now we're looking at a minimum average of 85 with no grade below 75. I mean, where do you get to right. the point where you right. say, okay, these expectations are too low? Um, that, that's that's just my. Yeah. And I know that we've had this conversation. I just don't remember the year in which we had it. So mm -hmm. my concern is that. You know, I think the original. What is went, passing at the high school? What 65. grade is sixty-five? Okay, because I, I was like, I don't know that mm -hmm. sixty-five. Okay. I think the intent of this, and I understand, I, and I agree. I, you know, but I think the intent is really for the AP uh, students in this situation. So I think maybe, you know, going forward, that's something to look at. Maybe, uh, maybe the quarterly GPA total. Uh, I we I've never we've never done that, so I don't know how that would work. Other places um, do that. Um, I, you know, because I guess my concern is I understand that there should be a, a benefit or not a benefit. There should be it, it there should be, be a detrimental, weight, but it shouldn't be detrimental. I agree. But also, 
a student and and a parent or whoever's helping them guidance counselor they do have to weigh whether or not they should be in an AP course not because it's going to not let them get honors but because you know they may, they may struggle and they may about a college looking at this is looking at somebody who increases their difficulty as time goes on and really you know tries to be, like doesn't take five AP classes in their well you can't in their sophomore year and then two in their senior year. you know you want to you want to see that building you want to see that growth and I I just have a, a real hard time saying somebody can make the honor roll AP or not with 75 I agree I agree what what goal is being reached at a 75 I mean I was that student that had the 79 when I was in high school and it was one point and yeah was it detrimental yeah but what do you do the next term you work harder for that extra point so my concern is that it's it's like one of those everybody gets a trophy type of thing I think we need to make sure these expectations stay high and they reach for those expectations if we continue to lower these expectations I just get I'm just concerned I have a tough time with that that honor roll change can I ask just a clarifying question mm -hmm. um, Mike on this so the idea of having a minimum average of 85 with no grade below a 75 you're so you're saying for so this language reads so for that particular grading quarter, mm -hmm. all of your averages combined would have to average to an 85, but Correct. that allows for um, what? what? I mean, how many, how many 75s are you, are, like, how many 75s can be calculated into that, I guess is what I'm saying. Is it, I how guess, many courses in a quarter? I guess, like, that's what I'm asking. I guess, so, like, I'm thinking. Six, seven. Six. Seven right? at like most. Two. You know, I mm -hmm. think if you're looking at your report card and you've got seven classes and you have three with you know three 75s and then you've got four with 90s no. does that kid I mean that kid doesn't make the honor roll not in my book no I don't think the average would be where it needed to be I, I, was, I, was I mean so I think I don't so, take my phone out at I mean when, when you think of language this way right so what I'm asking so, I mean, yeah you're yeah. talking one grade or are you talking like yeah. this is what I'm trying to this is the point well, I'm trying I think to get I to think if they have exactly. three grades of 75 they're not going to make the honor roll but it, no it matter has, how even with four 100 so if you did all the math you average it up I'm doing it right now yeah but that, but that, I was gonna say that would be subjective okay so this person has three I mean there's so many different variables to that understood but I'm trying I think I what I'm hearing the committee concerned about I'm trying to paint that picture mm -hmm. right so I think what I'm hearing the committee saying is they're concerned that a child could have a C in a particular class or two classes and then the rest have you know stronger grades but still make the honor roll what I'm hearing the committee say is is that you know and I certainly don't want to you know say anything that's not being said but nobody with any C's on their report card should be making the honor roll mm -hmm. period the end is that is that kind of where the line is being drawn or is it only if that C is in advanced mm -hmm. so so let's say it's weighted and you have you have a AP course you have an honors course and you have a regular college placement course everybody's taking algebra mm -hmm. I, you know mm -hmm. I don't even know there's probably not AP algebra but we're making it up so everybody's taking algebra. Mm -hmm. And the person who's taking the AP algebra gets, gets the C. But their C is a 2.4. Versus the, the honors person, their C is a 2.3. Mm -hmm. And the, the college placement person, their C is a 2.0. And then when you average that out, you, know, you need to be 3.8 or higher, and then 3.5 or higher. You know, to to get the honors because you you get you're do you're it's assumed you're doing additional work. It's assumed you're going above and beyond to do AP or to do honors and and you know that that's built in the classroom. And the benefit is that you have the weighted GPA and your GPA is above that. But but if but if you had somebody who did phenomenal in two and got two one hundreds and then a bunch of eighties and a seventy five and a seventy four because. Mm -hmm. Well, no, a 75, because no grade below a 75. They, they be in the honors, and, you know, I don't know. I mean, we've played, um, Wendy, you've mentioned this, so we, we've probably changed this pulse, this practice a few times um, to look at what would be fair and flexible for everyone. So I think when I originally started, 
it, 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 it was a minimum average of 90 with no more than, a, than, no more than one grade below a 90 mm -hmm. or an 85. Mm -hmm. When we started uh, pushing students to take AP, and we had, currently we have 11 AP courses, that's when parents and students came to me, expressed their concern and said, um, my son or daughter is pushing themselves in some AP level mm -hmm. classes, but they're not getting the 80 or above. And so they're not on or in the paper with mm -hmm. honor, you know, with the, um, with the honor roll. Mm -hmm. Um, We've actually had parents say they're not taking AP because they won't make honor roll. Right, but I, mean, I, 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 I understand that. But it's not to lower. It's not uh, to lower this. It's to make an adjustment to how it's measured, okay. not to lower the the grade. But the the can't receive a grade lower than seventy five. But instead, look at it as a as a as a weighting method, which is. I agree with you because you know you're still holding that expectation in those particular students that would pick a, a, a lower course per se. You know, having knowing that it's weighted, it's okay to to stretch that. You know, but to to, to be discouraged because they don't want to get a one grade below a seven. I just I, I agree with Jane. I, I really to, do. And I think to that point, right? So so if we're if we look at the purpose behind all of this, by the way, right? So. My sense is it's to make sure that kids are college ready, mm -hmm. right? So, well, what's the what's the what's the method methodology that we use for that whole process? Well, it's their GPA, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know that it matters honor roll, higher roll, anything else. I think maybe to Jane's point, let's try to run that and see what that looks like, mm -hmm. and perhaps that's a way to kind of. Then there would be no minimum of anything. Wouldn't There'd be no minimum of anything. That, you and it's all weighted and it's all... 3.8? Because that's, at you. the end of the day, <laughs> for college acceptance, that's that's kind of, that's the number that matters, right? But, right. And, right. It, and it aligns. It aligns to that, right. to, to where you're headed. That, yeah. Right. Is that, is that, It'll is it runnable by quarter? Too. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. <laughs> well, it's runnable well, by quarter. Is it run I, my question was, the, the original change came because it was an administrative nightmare. Well, I think the original change to what it, what it, as it states, is is due to the fact that um, when you run X2, you have to put in a minimum grade in right. order to run the report to see what honor roll looks like and being able to put that on the report card. A adding that element of AP in a 75, it was, it was a manual. Yeah, that's when the AP uh, kids get themselves, you right. know, we're, right. we're unfortunately right. at a 75 or a 79 or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. But so looking at a way to GPA, works. we could. Yes, yeah. so if we go ahead. that's something that we could look at and explore to see, and and also looking at the numbers um, of how many students are making honor roll at that point. Because at one point we did an average. We just cut it at, at average. <clears throat> if you have an average of a 90 or above, then you made high honors. And some schools did that, but what we found was that a lot of our electives students are getting 95s or above, yeah. and getting two or three C's in core content areas, and all of a sudden we had 70% of our kids making high honors. Mm -hmm. yeah. That happened for one year. <laughs> we made that mistake. And, and the reverse happened. I mean, when I was on this, the, the academic council, you know, kids were getting hundreds in science and then would get a 65 in band and they wouldn't make it because they had that low grade, you know, so. Yes, yeah, so we don't want that either. <laughs> I mean, I think that's so there's all the scenarios that you argue with yourself when you think about this. But I think GPA is a maybe that's the way to look at it. GPA. I mean, if that's administratively that. easier. Well, two cents. That's yeah. my two cents. That's it. That's so then you just. So what would the equivalent? What would the GPA be? So then you have to kind of figure that out, right? Yeah, you have to decide yeah. if it's. You do it of a, by, based on a ninety or a. Three point. You have to figure out the the conversions. Okay, that's something we'll explore there. Um, so, so I think the two big um, items no. on our handbook changes um, that we wanted to discuss. One was the attendance policy, which can, can I just flag one thing? I'm so yes. sorry. I, I just the, I've the words equity and access ringing in my head right now as we're talking about this, and I don't want to have a missed opportunity to discuss this in in our courses. Um, and Ms. PG, maybe you can speak to this better. But do you know where I'm going with this? So in our courses where you know, we have uh, students with special needs that are in a substantially separate class, or in a, are things weighted any different? I don't want to inadvertently 
block out kids from being able to access that because we create some system that I just yeah okay so we should we'll just make sure to take that into consideration too when we look at this because I don't want to inadvertently block a particular group of kids from being able to access that if mm -hmm. back to our other conversation if it's required that they have that level of support to access the curriculum we don't want to then in return say okay you're accessing the curriculum we're giving you the support but it's this isn't weighted correctly somehow and you're not able to access an honor roll type status or something like that with So I think a high school level is 1.0, and mm -hmm. then we go up to a 1.2 for AP. Okay, so it's not as, okay. So it's 0.5 increments in terms okay. of not, um, CP is 1.05. keep an eye on that to Honors make sure that 1. we don't 1. inadvertently do something we don't mm -hmm. need to with mm -hmm. yeah, sorry, some groups of kids. Yeah, okay. But it makes a difference. Yeah. Um, does anyone have any questions about the attendance policy? In terms of, I think it's pretty similar no, to yeah. what <laughs> middle school mentioned. We have three days. At the high school, Keith can speak to this a little bit more, but we were we were at five days, um, which some students and families took the five, which meant that we had uh, chronic absenteeism, uh, a significant amount of that because students were able to take their five. And then we clarified what was excused and, and not excused. We had this conversation yesterday at our open house with some parents. I'm glad we put that out on the table. I think we the, the point of clarity came up. Uh, it was communicated pretty well, uh, and they understood. So if somebody has a cold and they can't come in for one day, we're not expecting everybody to go to the physician to get a note. But they have one of three days for that quarter to be able to um, to be able to do something like that. And if a student is ill for more than one day, the, the parents are going to go take the doctor go anyway. Right. Right. So they right. get a note. But I think what we've seen, <clears throat> and I think Dr. DeFalco mentioned it. If they get five, they're taking five. They, yeah. they think it's like vacation. Bonus. The benefit. You yeah. know, and, and it, the senior class is a, little, is a little different because in the, third, in the fourth quarter, they're allowed less days. Yeah, it's quarter, and it's yeah. amazing how 99% of them follow it without a problem. So I think our feeling is if they can do it in the fourth quarter, we can get the entire school to buy into it and get to school more often. Mm -hmm. When you're legitimately ill, stay home. If you need to see a doctor, see a doctor, but otherwise, get yourself to school. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the other piece to that, just to, for a point of clarity, when we look at the state and we look at what's the definition of chronic absenteeism, it's 10%. If you're missing 10% of the school year, for us it would be 18 days, you're chronically absent, whether it's excused or not. And I think a lot of families and, parents and students don't realize that, that you could be excused for 35 days. That doesn't mean that you're not chronically absent. Right. Um, it, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't affect your grade, your standing in class in terms of an academic 50 or not. I mean, will it affect your academic standing because you're not in school? It, it most likely would. But I think a lot of people hear, well, everything's excused, so that's not going to be an issue. We receive zero points for the accountability because of chronic absenteeism and not having a 95% attendance rate. And that's something that we, as a district, are making sure that that happens. And that's in place for every school, mm -hmm. that same attendance policy, uh, practice rather, and, and waiting system for our new accountability system. Correct. Yeah. And we have a, a, a data team at the high school. We review that once a month, and we, we, are, we have a clear view and eye on um, supports for, for, for parents and, and students that are uh, at that level. Um, the, the other big um, item that I wanted to discuss was uh, final exams and midterms. Um, we are looking to replace midterms and finals with, quote, reasonable alternatives to traditional end of year assessments. Um, I've done my research and looked at various districts across the um, Central Mass. We've had conversations with staff for the last seven years that I've been there in terms of what is the, um, the why behind midterms and finals and how does that prepare students for career in college uh, versus looking at authentic uh, project-based um, you know, various assessments throughout the year that we could implement um, within the school year. Um, and we decided to go along with 
looking at alternatives um, for midterms and finals. Um, I think the other piece to that is we all we always or we've heard the term student agency, so providing voice and choice for kids. Um, to me, I think is is beneficial, um, and I'd love to be able. I'm really excited to see what our teachers come up with in terms of creative assessments, um, whether it's a summative or a formative, end of year, mid year, quarterly, whatever that looks like. Um, that. Um, is something that I'm looking forward to. I know some people are concerned about written exams. We're not taking away written chapter quarterly exams. We're not taking away major tests, major tests, MCAS, PSATs, the three hour AP exams that 70, well, 50% of our students are doing. Um, I just think that we need to go and review what assessments look like and how do we increase student agency for our students. Um, so that was the other big piece. Um, so when you look at page 26 or page two of your correct, um, the uh, revision page, we nixed final exemptions, incentive policies, um, and added the changes for summative evaluation activities and assessments. <laughs> Amy, <laughs> you can start. No, I, I no, I, you don't want me to start because I, I think this is just grand. Go ahead, I, I, speak to it. I, but this, it says reasonable alternatives to traditional, but a, an instructor could still choose an, a, a traditional, or not. They, they can't. They could. They could, right? They could. They could. If that best I, serves their meeting of the needs. If, and if that, if the department feels that that's the direction that they want to go. Uh, that I would be more than happy to have that conversation mm -hmm. and ask the question of why. Mm -hmm. And if there's a reasonable answer to that, that I feel is sound and research-based, then we would move in that direction. Um, I, I'll tell you, I went to, I won't name districts, but I just went to a school district where 90% of their kids are doing internship projects at the end of the year. Yeah. And there's an academic symposium with a community <coughs> full in the gymnasium talking about their intern internship experience. I have another district that I'm going to at the end of the school year. Their last three days are built-in workshops, having students talk about their learning. I feel a true life skill for any kids, career, college or career, is to be able to talk about their learning, to explain it and effectively communicate. Do I feel that our kids are there now? I don't. I feel that these alternative assessments will be able to get students to be a little more flexible and push them to be able to provide authentic voice behind some assessments that they have for the, for the year. Okay. But to your point, if departments or teachers want to use an assessment that they feel is, is, is valuable, I'm more than happy to have that conversation. Um, and, and who decides what's reasonable? The department or the or you or the learning who decides <coughs> students i think it's a great, <laughs> i think it's a great question um i mean ultimately i would put that on myself okay i with, would as with, well with collaboration from from staff um uh, but also looking at um my the assistant superintendent superintendent to guide me to um you know uh provide me with, with, with information as, as to what they feel would be uh, a valuable summative assessment for our kids. So um, we could feel comfortable knowing that what a, a teacher has chosen to help students develop as an end project, if you will, mm -hmm. has had some kind of review. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. And I, I, will, I will say that there's been some flexibility with our assessments. When we think about our sure. visual arts department, yeah. we've had videos created we have had individual portfolio assessments digital portfolios and that uh, really aligns well with some schools some colleges are looking for portfolios right. mm -hmm. um, music department uses audio yep. music mm -hmm. department is audio um, I, I think you know various states look at portfolio based assessments for four years I mean, imagine having your son or daughter at the end of uh, four years of high school being able to showcase what they did from day one freshman year with a writing sample, art work, uh, 
an audio file to where they are Correlate. on the last day of the senior year, that to me would be powerful. Um, so I think that that's something that we look at. A lot of districts are looking at green screen assessments. We have kids out in the hallway video recording themselves, mm -hmm. talking about what they learned, why they learned, and really articulating the learning behind what they just received in a, in a unit uh, or, or lesson. Um, that to me, I think, is, uh, is really powerful in terms of the impact on, on the learning and the, the, the activity that's going on. Um, are written assessments important? Absolutely. Sure. But I think there's other ways in being able to create some flexibility in providing voice and choice for our, stu our students as well as our educators in the building. Okay, Tammy. So I, when you're speaking about art classes in, in some of those classes, I think uh, doing a work product of a video, that is a traditional assessment for that type of that type of class what you can produce if you're in a video production class your video that you produce that that is a true traditional end of course assessment for that type of class my fear with this and and I think when when I read through the honor roll I felt like we were lowering some standards here I I felt that a little bit I get authentic learning I also am concerned about what happens when my student goes to college and they have their first cumulative exam and they don't know what to do because they've never been prepared to study that way. Um, I, we, in my district, we got we did away with cumulative exams at one point. We do a we do a end of year portfolio um, in addition to the exams at first. We've removed them and now we've put them back in because we don't feel like we're getting that quality assessment at the end. However, if we want to move that way, I think it's a great, it's, we can try that. How are we going to equitably assess these, um, what are you calling them? These assessments. What, what, is there going to be some sort of rubric committee that puts, puts together the measurement or is it going to be a teacher off the top of the head of this is an 85 where's the how are we going to get an authentic qualitative measurement of whatever we do and I like Jane's point of how how do you know that it's a reasonable alternative so that's been answered but I I just I worry about the product and the in the assessment of the standards being met and the impact moving forward for the students. and and certainly the impact if they've never have had a cumulative exam because as we have all experienced that is something that you have to learn oh, to yeah. deal with but, but I, I don't think that should be the focus of our our, our learning <laughs> Is college they prep come out of it college, they they college, come out of college it prep, is, SAT, college prep should be our focus for learning how to take a test college prep should be our part of our reason for learning mm -hmm. they Art. have to take tests in college yep well he's not doing away with all tests yeah I'm just saying you know and I think uh, and I want to speak mr. Dick we've talked about this to be honest with you we've talked about this portion this part for seven of years yeah, yeah yeah but th as far as this year you know we haven't talked that much about it him and I but I think you know I think the teachers hopefully I think the goal is to have a major project exam or something per quarter I will tell you and, and Tammy you know um, final exams most of our top students are exempt right mm -hmm. my son your daughter is not taking final exams at the end of the year but they they're are taking they, SATs, are the, they are the ones that are they're taking, taking SATs PSATs, and AP. they've taken yep. MCAS they're doing all the major assignments but they're not taking final exams the top kids so I think mr. Dudek is saying we're still gonna have tests right. we're still gonna have tests or projects per quarter but I think the traditional final exam is something he's looking to change yeah. to make it different. Yeah, and if, and if I can capstone experience, <clears throat> and if I can just weigh in quickly on this, I think there's I think there's a couple things for us to be thinking about with this as far as the student experience goes and the preparation. I think it's college preparedness, yes, but it's also career and work for, workforce preparedness. And we all know because we've gone through clearly, all of us have gone through this process that there there is no. So think about when we are displaying what 
we know or what we have learned and what we have to to get others to understand it. We're not giving um, our Facebook Live thing last night. We didn't send home a written exam to, the, to over a thousand people that watched it to see if they got the information, but we had visuals, we had graphics, we had information displayed and graphs and charts and right, we were trying to articulate clearly our understanding of this budget process through the cycle to get others to get that information. I think that's what we're trying to really do at, at, a, at a stronger level. I think the way we assess kids, and I think MCAS is probably the, the, the worst offender of this, to be frank, is the most lowest level regurgitation, entry level, knowledge based transfer from one thing to another. Uh, and what, what saddens me as an educator, because you're not wrong, Tammy, about that, by the way, but what saddens me is that we still have to prep kids for that. Mm. And a big, a big issue right now is with higher education. We think we are moving the wheel slow in the K-12 sector for change. Look at higher ed. That's even worse. And so as we are trying to prepare our kids for you know, college, I put that in quotes because they're behind our, I would put our teachers up against college professors any day. Excuse was, me. Not yours, not yours. <laughs> but as far as, the, as far as the lecture goes, but you know what I'm saying. As far I as do. the lecture right. goes in the traditional, Still chalk right? and, so, chalk right. and talk. Yeah. And so I just think, I, I think any time when in education, whenever the pendulum is swung completely one way, we've lost something and it comes back the other way and we lose something again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whether it's, you know, phonics-based instruction versus whole oh. literacy, you know, the that whole was a fail. thing, right? So I think what I'm, what I'm hearing is there needs to be some hybrid, some marriage, some choice mm -hmm. with a really thorough vetting system to ensure that kids are given multiple ways of showing their learning. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Okay. Yeah, and from mm -hmm. what I see here, in my experience in my past two years of school, as many cumulative exams as I've had at the end of programs, I've had more group projects and different sorts of finals that never are the same thing and are always something different that make me really work and look back at everything I did in the semester. So having this here, at least for a college like the one I go to is really important because I wasn't prepared for a group project final where I have to work with four other people and come up with something that really shows what the semester was like because I was taking either taking cumulative finals or getting out of my finals while I was here. So It's a great plug for Nichols because not many schools are doing that. Yes, really. that's, that's what made me think of that. Like, yeah. well, my school does that. That's, that's awesome. Um, Okay. There's a so I think also just um, yeah. from a reflective standpoint, looking at maybe the, uh, the the verbiage in terms of what reasonable alternatives are, um, maybe a little more specific in, in terms of what that looks like. But if anybody had um, any any thoughts in terms of the verbiage, um, in terms of that, or what's traditional versus not. I, I, um, I guess from my perspective, I would just like. Something indicated that there's some kind of review of some kind of, of vetted some system, some kind of and you know a designed rubric. I mean, even if it's a you know you'll perform a musical piece, it's the expectation that it will be blah 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 blah. So some you know I mean they're doing rubrics anyway. They're doing you know yeah. How do you measure it? They're do they're all doing that. That, anyway. that to me I think yeah. the specifics would be aligned in in the in the syllabi that uh, students are getting yeah. and receiving yeah. from, from. And that teachers. that's reviewed. That's all I want. Yeah, to maybe <coughs> it's reasonable alternatives reviewed and approved by yeah. X Y and Z people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think there's there's definitely um, moments for me and with the team to be able to explore what other districts are doing. Absolutely. So being able to uh, imagine, you know, having five or six days where there's no review and in finals or midterm week where we could be doing career based workshops, mm -hmm. personal finance, financial literacy. We just had CPR training for our seniors. Being able to have moments for th of that to be able to do that. I mean, one school has something called 21st Century Learning Conferences mm -hmm. where they align businesses to come into the building, but not having days that are free or open to be able to do that, um, I think that's, that's a disservice to our kids. I'm, okay. Again, I'm going to one district where the last three days is an opportunity for kids to be able to showcase what they know and we're sending a team on that Monday, the June 10th, 10th um, to see what that looks like and what that process was. Right. They knew they needed to do something different 
They didn't know what it was going to be at that moment, but that was a year time for them to be able to say, this is what we're doing. This is how we're going to and do it. And that's for all underclassmen. You know, by the 10th, their seniors are going also. Correct. And we're trying to move our seniors more towards a fourth quarter internship yeah. to get them in the real world, to get them ready for whatever the next phase of their life is. So, you know, over the last couple of years, I think that program has, gro has grown. I've been in the last two conferences uh, dealing with internships in fourth quarter. And I think we're in the same path as some of those other schools that started with four, went to eight, 16, 32. <clears throat> I was at one school that had 204 of the 216 seniors involved in fourth quarter internships. Okay. So I think that's what we're trying to accomplish right. mm -hmm. and build on um, with or, our seniors or, anyway. Or do that push-in yeah. that you mentioned. There's a, like a push-in internship where we're inviting people to our school in, mm -hmm. to really programs. showcase what we're yeah. doing um, or what they're doing. Is exam week contractual? as far as the half days that students get, so those become no. full no. days and no. project. It's full uh, days for staff. Yeah. And, and full days for, for students. students. Yeah. It's a yeah. 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 review days. days. Students do choose to, yeah. to leave at half day. Um, I know you have many, many more pages, and I know that um, I have a, a committee member who needs to leave, so I need to break right here for just a minute and we will get back to your other pages but we have some action items that yes. we need to cover yep. um, before we Don't lose quorum wait did you lose quorum finally i thought so. if you yeah. leave we do i leave we lose yeah. quorum so okay. so <laughs> i have to leave sorry oh. hold sorry, your I have hold, to leave hold that though all about you karen <laughs> item c I know, I'm sorry. and we have item e i have, right. I have a son waiting so, for me and he's sad that nobody shows up if i don't so we need to move leave an eight yes okay can we yep yep so like <laughs> go um so um as a, the committee is aware that I represent the school district on the and I serve uh, on the board for the BICO for the collaborative the special ed collaborative and so uh, the committee needs to reappoint me to sit on that board and represent the district I'll make that motion who said that me you okay second okay uh, it's been moved and seconded to appoint the superintendent to serve on the BICO collaborative board any discussion all those in favor aye, aye. aye. any opposed Okay. You want this one signed or just um, yeah? If you sign that one, that's great. Okay. Um, and the uh, next item that requires action is a vote to approve the director of learner support services contract. Um, and I know we've had a chance to discuss the contract um, with the uh, committee, and so I'm looking for approval for that contract as written. So I will entertain a motion to approve an employment contract for the director of learner supports is that what we, learner called? support services learner support services um mrs jill pilagolo oh sorry pg uh, pg <laughs> i'm gonna get it i'm gonna get it pilagala rani all right so okay. moved uh moved by sarah seconded by jack any discussion all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Welcome. We look forward to the partnership. Great. Oh, uh, yeah, this will go around. Karen, soon. you need to sign. Awesome. All right, now, continuing on. And like I said, I'm good till 8. I just wanted to make okay. sure we. Yes. yes. We, Mike, we may I ask a question on down. the replacement of class officers? Who then becomes the officer that you remove? What? I think Page. you probably run an election. Three. Page two. Two. The open spot. So if you have two people who run at the beginning, four people run at the beginning of the year, one person gets elected, they behave poorly, does the next person become that office? I think office? the reason what we adjusted this, want? we haven't. We skipped it. We haven't oh. had to put this into play in, in many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, until this year when we had a oh. person who was elected and then um, had some major attendance issues um my my feeling and most people might do but like you said if you had four it would be the next highest vote getter i would assume okay in most cases there's no more than two people that run for one position mm -hmm. right at our school and i think that's something that we just needed to deal with this year and mm -hmm. we're trying to figure out how to handle i just want to know students know the expectation um and that so they do. When they run for office, they get all the requirements okay. to, mm -hmm. to run for that office before they can get their yeah, signatures and I, stuff so they same. have it all. 
um, but it was it was kind of unclear in the handbook, so we're just kind of cleaning it up a little bit. Okay. And the the change to 95 for a National <laughs> Honor Society is that a National Honor Society thing, or are we just choosing to up the ante? That that was the, our NHS. Um, advisor along with I believe the students that said that they wanted to, to raise that bar so it's above the national what they um, prescribe under the actual National Honor Society I, I'm not sure what it's okay if it is, is. I'm just asking yeah, I, just, I, I don't know what the prescribed okay is. but th I mean th this year's NHS induction was mm -hmm. one of the largest that we've yeah, had mm -hmm. if not one of the if not largest in quite some time. Quite some time. And it was under this stand. This Correct. fell under Correct. that. They fell. Yeah, with the Even 95. Even though it wasn't in place there. Okay. okay. Do you have who's next in line? I I think that will be an issue. That's why I asked the question. The um, replacement of class officers. I, I think I was just asking Tammy. Do you think it it should be outlined on what the protocol is? Meaning, if you just if you so choose, decide the next person. Up so they know what's expected. So if they see, you know, whatever the tally is or the scores, they know that if I don't do my job or due diligence, then the next person in line is this. Understood. It's not like a, a okay, what are we doing now? You know, like maybe a, something like that. But also, if it was only one person that ran, we'd have to run a, a second. Lot, yeah, like lot. like what the protocol is after something like that happens. I think it just needs to be spelled out a little bit. Well, and would you put it in here or on the form that you get? Probably both. Okay. I'm, I'm, that way, there's no secret. So, <laughs> God forbid you miss lose a form. You have it somewhere else. So you're saying just you. point of clarity protocols. Put that into the handbook itself. I, I would think into a place where it can be easily accessible to parents and students in case something like this comes up. It's not left open. Um, yeah, it's just, it's spelled out. What happens now? Right. Mm -hmm. You put it right in the application process. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. When they decide to run, it's one of those things. Right. They know what they're getting into. Yep. And we went over the attendance. Any questions on the attendance? No. Was I mean, pa page four, we just added extra help from teachers. So we, we added the support time during the day. It, that's not that 20 minutes in the beginning, is it? Is that, yes. Is that going away? 20 minutes in the beginning? Not as of now. Oh. As, as, okay. as far as I know, I, it's it's in there. Okay. I think structuring it differently and looking at how we can make formal formal time there. But okay. We also added the um, state law for attendance in our handbook because I don't believe yeah. it was there, as, as the middle school did. <clears throat> so we just made some key points just to express you know uh, the importance of absences. Um, making routine appointments. I think the other piece that we we added um, was that if uh, families who schedule routine appointments during the school day, they'll have an excused absence for the time of the appointment. So I think what what we find out sometimes is that they go for the whole day. They go for the whole day. It's it's a, it's dental a, cleaning at nine, and they don't yeah. come to school. Mm -hmm. yeah. They bring a note the next day to excuse it. And it states on there that the appointment was at nine fifteen for a routine dental, and they think medical documentation. Now I'm excused for the entire day. So we just wanted to Tighten clear that. Right. We added discipline consequences. We just added um, potential consequences if we. Oh, um, wait. Can you go back to um, the FA grade? FA grade. What, what page are you on? Page five. Thank you. Page five. So an FA is an attendance grade equal to a, so before they used to get a administrative 50. Now we're calling administrative 50 FA. I mean, I know the times. I know it went from six to four. I'm okay with that. But if somebody has below a 50, he or she will receive a lower grade. What's lower than an F? Well, if you have like a 35 in the class. What do you get? An F? Well, yeah, but the 35 will take your total average down. Well, yes, but an F is an F is an F. How do you get a lower? I guess that's my point. Not against get your GPA or your, or your honor roll average. Because, like, you fail the class at a 65, you, that your 65 right. average is computed back into everything else. But if you fail the class at a 35, then it's a lower average when you compare it to everything else. So your total GPA is lower. So if they get administrative 50s, well, 
you might miss a class four times on purpose if you have a 24 because then you get a 50 and your grade looks better for it. But if you had a 24, then your whole GPA comes down. So your GPA is, again, I'm going back to GPA, calculated on a grade, not a letter. A number, not a letter. Uh, a, Correct. A number. Based on your class Correct. average. So yeah. that's why it's an FA. Yep. But the, the thing about the GPA when you have it in the system is the GPA is weighted and there's right. too much coding required for the numbers, like the specific class scores, so it would be easier to do what you were saying on the GPA right. thing. So, but, but here it's a number. Well, because okay. all the classes are graded in a number, you're not going to get like a 4.0 in class, you get 100. Gotcha. And that, so we added the FA just right. for a point of clarity that if we're scanning through transcripts, right. we're seeing, okay. Yeah, the, the, it's a 50 equivalent because of absences and not due to just she a 50. Ability. Or she yes. didn't get it. Correct. Yeah. And then we wanted to clarify that if you did receive a grade below a 50, you that's what you received and not the automatic FA. Some students, again, would say, okay, I got the, F, the FA because I went over that cap for the quarter. Right. I'm not going to do anything for the rest of the quarter. Hmm. So the 23, so was, in hindsight, the 50 was better than them not doing anything for the for remaining of the quarter, the remainder of the quarter. So we gotcha. just wanted to clarify that. Gotcha. Okay, I'm good. Uh, the other, maybe another change just to mention was the tardiness on page eight. Yep. Um, it, the policy currently is that students can come into the building prior to 8.15 without a parent note. So if they wake up late and mom and dad are at work, they show up at 8, they don't need a note. 8.10, they don't need a note. Um, we found that um, we have some issues with some students that make it a norm. are making it a norm and using it for not because they slept in, because for other reasons. <laughs> so we've backed it up to 8 o'clock that if mm -hmm. they come in after 8, they need a note from a parent so the parent knows. Uh, what we do a lot, most of the time, is we have the kid call the parent oh, right in front parent. of us and we yeah. talk to him to make sure, hey, you know, Johnny's coming in late. Mm -hmm. um, so we just kind of backed it up to get him in the building sooner. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good with that. So we do start at 7.35. So they, they miss the entire period. Yeah. Um, and some would, yeah, 8.10 is they came in and there was no yeah, notification. The other stuff is just kind of cleaning up some language, making sure that we have things in there. Um, as far as for extracurriculars and school dances, which would be page 10. Hey, just that page 8, when they come in at the door, doors open at 645. I'm, at, I'm there every day by 630 the latest. He is. Um, so where do, me in. where do kids go? So uh, they, Mr. Bacon they is get there before the cafeteria. Well, well, it depends. I would say in the winter, they're all in the cafeteria. Okay. In the nice weather, a lot of them just sit out in the front on the on the benches and wait for their friends. Okay. Um, the cafeteria is open. Mr. Bacon opens it a little after six every morning. Uh, I get there by six thirty, so I'm in the building with him. Students, some students arrive by six thirty, and they go into calf. They do homework. They're on the Chromebook, and then at seven o'clock, when the ca when the kitchen opens, they have breakfast. Mm -hmm. But they can't get around the building. So what we don't want is them to just be walking randomly around the building when the other side of the building is just me and I'm not on the hall. So we try to hold the kids off there till about 725 when we open the doors for the buses so that they come and hang in. You know, they're not just hanging around the hallways unsupervised. We allow the teachers to get in a little bit before they get there. But every morning we have 100 kids in the cafeteria from okay. like 645 to 720, 725. Okay. Because the original language seems to say that there's some containment until the supervisory people get there, but that disappears in the new language. So that's why I was wondering where they. Well, we never used to let them in the main part of the building back in the day until the duty started at 725. Okay. We've changed that because there's, there's so many people meetings going on. And and they're high school kids, and we've got to trust them, and it's personal responsibility. Yeah. And, you know. And, it's, and it hasn't been a problem. There's been no issues in the morning with okay. with stuff going on in the hallway that shouldn't be going on. Okay. How many get there at 6.45? What's that? Do they have a lot? Do you have a lot that get there at 6.45? Um, Probably parent drop-offs. We have some parent drop-offs. They're on their way to work. They drop the kid off. Um, you know, a lot of I'm kids, like, they, they actually sit in the cafeteria and they do work. It's, their, uh, it's, it's their quiet time. Directed study for yeah. some. 
And then there's meetings. Every morning there's, there's some sort of meeting, some activity going on. But I think we've seen a significant increase um, with parent drop-offs. I mean, when I, we started, the, the doors did not open until 725. Students were just in the lower um, A. The, except the, for the winter. The, the A wing, except for the winter. But we, we are, yeah. we're, we're seeing more students coming in early um, before that bell. Thank you. And we added the same vaping um, diversionary program that the <coughs> middle school did. Is your passport like a pass? Is that what that is? A that passport. you're adding to the bathroom use? Yeah, so if you recall um, back in the day, um, every student got a, a passport. A handbook, a handbook that oh, had okay, the okay. entire handbook, the student handbook in it. It had an agenda, and the last four pages were our passes. Yep. Um, this year we didn't do that. We tried something different. Um, we are going to go back to the passport portion. Our handbook is still going to be online. We're not going to make copies for students. It'll be online. But they'll actually have a passport, which will have the school calendar at the beginning. And then it has the agenda. It, it has an agenda. Kids like they still write in the agenda. Mm -hmm. So they'll have agenda. But before the agenda, they'll be their, their passes. So they'll get one page per quarter like they used to. Oh, OK. I just didn't know what it was. Are all the bathrooms unlocked now, or are we still doing the upstairs? We're still to alternating, the floor alternating or up and lower. Oh, Lord. But the cafeteria is open. Cafeteria one's open all day long, so they use that during support, during lunch, during breakfast. Just not when they're in their classes. Well, if they're in band, they use that. If they're in PE, they use that at a locker room. That side of the room. Yeah. Hmm. All right. <clears throat> Any other questions for them? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Before we move to um, the summer programming or summer um, uh, math and reading uh, information, were there any final questions on the handbooks? <clears throat> no? Okay. Um, so, um, if we could just very quickly, just in the interest of time, just have the, uh, the um, elementary principals back to just quickly talk about the uh, summer math and reading work. And as they're coming up, uh, we will add that we um, were offered an opportunity for um, a participation in a pilot program through MyOn, which is an online library that's web-based um, that we have talked about uh, doing with all second and third graders next right. year, right? right. Um, they've offered us a pilot for the first summer reading for a dollar a kid. Um, and so um, we are going to take that on at the elementary level because the kids have a lot of choice. And we also know uh, that the, uh, I believe at this point, the Millville Library is not open. Is that right? It is library? open. It is open. Um, but it is not um, Limited. certified. So okay. uh, if Millville doesn't have the books, then a child from Millville cannot check them out at any other library anywhere okay. else. So we thought, what a what a good way yeah. to, to mm -hmm. help out with that particular issue uh, as, a, as a, you know, a community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, we will be um, purchasing a license for uh, each elementary student so they can read as many books as they'd like. Uh, and so will we have something that goes to the parents yes. that tells them how to access it? Absolutely. With any yeah. passwords, like yes. upside down. Either some sort of online video of us showing them how to use it or do a write up like step by step. Yeah. Yes. can take that home with their login information and right. all that stuff so they can have that. Of a video would be yeah. good. And we, we haven't looked at it good. yet, okay. but yeah. we do that have that a video. Do. Yeah. yeah. It would be yeah. good to post that on the website because yeah. everything yep. at the end of the year usually gets lost right. in yep. translation. So right. if it was in both places, it would be great. So this will be an awesome service for all of our elementary kids. And we also put the summer packets on mm -hmm. line, so that having that resource with it in that right. summer packet, like folder we'll call it, will also 
be another great spot for it to be so that if we have a video and or a handout, parents can access <coughs> it that way as well. I'm sorry. I was still reading the high school handbook. Could you tell me what the um, what the resource was called again? My own. My own. M Y O N. M Y O N. M Y O N. M Y and then capital O. And it'll be really cool for the uh, for the second and third grader, incoming second and third graders in particular, because they they actually will have the one to one uh, tablets that we got through that donation, and so they'll be able to keep cooking right along, and they'll go right in. They'll read the first um, grade level text at their particular level, and it's adaptive. So the kids will pick a bunch of you know genres of interest. It'll put a text forward to them if they're a second grader, and then it will start to adapt. Uh, based on the student's reading level, and there are over 6,000 uh, individual titles um, uh, in the library, and there is also an audio version of the text. So for our struggling readers, they can also listen to. So we went, Steve and I went in the fall to um, a Renaissance workshop, and we saw it there as well, and we were like in love with it. Three of mm -hmm. my staff went, awesome. uh, two of my staff went with me. And um, they were like, oh my gosh, how do we get this? How do we get this? So we were trying to figure out ways also, and it worked out that we got the donation um, to help us out because it it's, can be inexpensive, um, but it's such a beneficial tool. My, the staff is just beyond mm -hmm. thrilled about what resources the kids could get because, mm -hmm. and also just maybe the library is open, but not all kids get to the library. Mm -hmm. So sure. having yeah. this, mm -hmm. they can get that. Maybe their parents are working. Maybe their grandma and grandpa's and grandma and grandpa can't, you know, take them somewhere. So having that resource to be able to at their fingertips literally um it's going to be fantastic for the kids so who's who who tells the children what where to go for their level well that uh, excellent question because I because i know i, I mean research is saying <laughs> now not to share you know you're an r you're an m you're you know they're just right level so i'm assuming they're you're going to say if you're going to be a third grader you can start at third grade and it adjusts it accordingly exactly if i'm not yep. is, so is when that the kid logs in for the first time okay i'm a third grader and so it's I going like to be mysteries. based on that okay right. so we'll pull up a bunch right. of third grade mysteries a kid picks one mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden right. it will start to adapt based on all right. Oh, yeah. doing I just wanted to make sure it was somewhat. But so that brings my point of the material that's in front of us because that has level this, level that, level. Yeah, you're not supposed to do that anymore. Yeah. So, so and fontness, font, font is and Pinel. And, no. and for those of us who are not in elementary education or education, you just spoke, you just handed me something in Chinese <laughs> <laughs> or another language. I don't want to pick on one in particular, but you know, it's just like, I, if this came to me mm -hmm. it'd be like oh, I'll pick a book so it just needs so the, we need to develop the summer one. work not only for the students but for the the parents particularly at the elementary level for the parents to aid folks and develop their knowledge base as well so um, we that those were more suggestions when those packets were put together is just ideas for parents if they were and at that point we were using the ones a lot more but i know our reading specialists have been big in, and the classroom teachers have been big on teaching the kids if there's five words on a page you don't know the book's too hard so um that's been a, a, something that we've been using a lot with the kids. and the more into what their interest is as well you know if they're really interested in you know the ocean then they may push themselves a little bit harder and try something a little bit harder mm -hmm. so it's yeah, so we're somewhat away from the level. It's more about the topic and the genre. So maybe we want to take a and the student crack learning at it. what their level is. Yeah, right. Like the development of learning, having a child learn. Okay, I know what I can read, mm -hmm. um, and teachers knowing what their level is and behind the scenes. But mm -hmm. to actually say it, then it turns into this competition, and that's why they're pulling right. away from that. Um, so you know, I agree with you, Jane. I do think that this Mayan is going to be successful in that particular mm -hmm. instance where some students don't know you know where they are as a reader um, I, I know when I get these packets and and I've been teaching over 20 years these are difficult these yeah. these are you know and if I didn't know where to go um, but the, these can be very cumbersome mm -hmm. um, so and there's one particular grade that grade four has um, like one book that they do do um, for we had two different books yeah. because we found that in Millville, the teachers in the lower grades had read that as a read aloud to the kids, so they <coughs> had heard it twice. Right. And then in um, Millville, 
reads tornado in grade four and stone fox, stone stone fox, fox. In, mm. in AFM. So that was and, one thing we did. And I, was, I, I do have to commend, I believe, the middle school and the high school at one point, they were doing that all book. Mm -hmm. one you know, book. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that's an amazing concept. Um, whether it's a read aloud to your child, whether it's them reading, but I think in terms of management in the summer, um, you know, requiring that book and maybe supporting it through giving them that summer read book, and then the extras can come in, in a packet. But I think to mainstream it, both Millville and Blackstone coming together, I think I think a book, you know, per grade, I think is is a really important concept. Um, for the summertime and especially you know with parents and the kids going all over the place you know hi giving a student at least one book that's consistent and and across grades I think is a, is a really great concept and I know high school did it I know middle school that it has done it I know you know one of my my sons have taken home Stone Fox at one point but in terms of consistency it's just a really great entrance to school and I just think it's it, mm -hmm. it it just makes it easier for the parent to say, okay, the teacher gave you this book, we're going to read it. Um, it just makes it more manageable. I, I do worry about the packets that come home. I, I think part of our hope is for next year, these will be revised because the ELA is being revised mm -hmm. next year, the curriculum review. So we're hoping with whatever comes out of that, that we'll be able to tweak the packets to also meet. We didn't want to go crazy doing them again and then have them again next year. So. We figured with Mayan, um, it would be a fantastic resource to let the kids. Most of the books are reading what they want to read. There's only one grade that we have um, that. So we thought that with the Mayan, it would be a great resource for them to use to um, but, to do that little challenge. But I guess my, my caution mm -hmm. is not only reading. My caution is math as well. I mean, if I you know look at this fifth grade you know contract, essentially, um, and I, I have to do something pretty much every day of July and every day of August. And, and I'll be the first to admit, um, when my child was in elementary school, I was that helicopter parent who's like, oh, no, today we've got to play that. I, no, no. Every day of July, every day of August, no. And I realize some of them are very simple, like, you know, do something really simple. But... But the message that's being sent to me as a parent is there is no break to learning, which is a good message. But not only is there is no break to learning, but you're going to be accountable for every minute of that day of that learning. And it's not going to be learning, you know, the animals at the zoo, or it's not going to be learning the um, states as we travel through them, or it's not, you know, it's, it's going to be, you know, oh, 20 minutes. I, I just, I think. Quality, not quantity. And takes the joy out of summer. This, you know, just right here, if this, if, if a two page, five days a week, something every day, and, and I don't, I don't disagree that there, you know, we need to reinforce learning and we need to be, you know, practice, practice, practice. I tell my students every single day, if you don't go home and practice, if, you know, you don't learn a, how to play a guitar by going to a lesson and never picking up the guitar again. So I get we want to reinforce math or reading or and having them do it all the time, but it there just there has to be a better way to kind of present that concept than a, you know, contract that they'll do it and, and something that they have to do or should do or it's recommended they do every single day. So we are actually I just noticed we're missing a page in this packet. We're oh. missing the one so there's so it's fifteen activities per month so there's the calendar of options but then there's also the websites and apps um one but we're missing we had a blank log in here where the kids wrote what activity they did so it could be i counted my mom gave me a handful of coins and i counted a handful of coins mm -hmm. so we did obviously based on the grade level but we're, we are missing the one page that's the blank log that said what alternative activities they did so these were just <coughs> suggestions and it said um if choosing alternative math activity, see the list. Please use blank pages to create your own summer math calendar. So we mm -hmm. did give a blank like calendar grid so that they could make their own if they wanted. So it wasn't set to just the, the grid for July. I, I just I, I think to Jane's point, and being a mom of 
four and working full time. Do you have a packet? Do you have a packet? Do you have a packet? What are you doing today? What are you doing today? What are you doing today? It just is cumbersome. It, it's like, how can you mainstream? How can you mainstream the same message, whether you're three, four, five, or you're K one two? How do you mainstream that so that if you have a, you know, if you 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 have a working working parents coming home just coming from summer, you know, the same message. I think would be easier. Like the mm -hmm. same message, whether, you know, lower grades, you know, how can you mainstream? That's the question is how can you mainstream reading and, and math so that it's, it's manageable for parents? Um, it makes sense when they come in. For instance, if you had a book and you bring in, hey, did everybody read? Let's talk about the message in the book. Let's, you know, if you're, you know, it's just how can you mainstream it? Every grade, every school has a different packet so think about that when you come home and your kid comes home at the end of the year and they have these packets how can you mainstream that um, I, I just it is very cumbersome and there is a lot of tools that are sent home and i get that but when you have multiple ages and you're trying to figure out what's best for everybody in your household including yourself as a working parent that's the key question. How can you mainstream that for parents? And, I, and you know, and I, I mean, I, I love the idea of, you know, you're cooking dinner and use the recipe to do the measurements and do the math. And I guess that to me is a, a helpful hint for parents of ways to keep math alive, as opposed to, I checked off the, the calendar dates and made my log of math and made my log of reading and made my log of, of, of you know, in some families, Five different logs. So is the is it just a point of clarity? The idea is they would pick fifteen of these twenty the, the twenty options here each and, month. But each there's month. also this that they could do the alternative with the apps. Okay. And or websites. Um, and then there's a blank sheet that comes home, and you write down everything that, <laughs> that you they do. can so they like can map, say I did, right. right. There's yeah. also like math books, literature to do um, different games that they could play. <laughs> so there's alternatives as sure. well to their calendar. But the hope is that they do 15 activities per month, July and August, which is essentially 50% of the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then in addition to that, um, in Blackstone, uh, Tristy Collier is coming to our, our school next week. She's going to present the library summer book club, so the book activity. So she's coming Tuesday, I believe, mm -hmm. to all of us. And, uh, Does she come to all the grades? For just second grade, um, she's, she's coming to all my. Coming to yeah. all, yeah. yeah. Coming to all. And she she put, she has great great things. Yep. To get kids reading. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I had done last year, and I'm going to do again this year, is I encourage all the kids to take pictures of themselves okay. reading, mm -hmm. and email them to me throughout the summer. And I made a big bulletin board, and I encourage the kids to be kind of goofy. I had kids like swimming, and reading in a, like an inner tube. <laughs> a couple kids were underwater reading. Mm -hmm. It was it was pretty neat. So, but just put the thought of reading in their heads all throughout yeah. the summer. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, not not so much the log, but just think about reading and try to be, you know, reading. do it on vacation. Had kids on, you know, on a tram, all kinds of crazy <laughs> things. But just the thought of reading all throughout the summer is really what I want to accomplish. So that's what I'm going to do again. Great. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. Middle school? Did you want me to just share or did you have any questions or? Just a quick quick overview would be great. So um, for sixth grade. <laughs> what happened, Jen? I think that's wise. <laughs> so our, our entire summer summer reading program is thank, thanks to our PTO donations and purchasing the books. Um, last year for sixth grade, we had chose one book. Um, it was from by Dusty Bowling, who was kind of a little unknown author, but is now huge. So we had she actually ended up coming by to visit the school when she went to Unlikely Story in Plainville. She did a webinar. Um, not sure that that's going to happen again. We might have outdone ourselves this past year. So looking at the money, the funds that we had from the PTO, working with the sixth grade teachers, we thought that the students may enjoy an author study. Um, Gordon Corman is a huge middle, middle grades writer. And this was 
these four books came in a pack so that we were able to have a cost for what is the where are you looking books yeah. i don't have any list of books you don't have summer reading no we, we have just this, have this it doesn't have any yeah I, I didn't it's not on here it's going to it's on the school's website can you tell us what those books are yeah like, it's um ungifted by these are four sixth grade it's four books by gordon corman ungifted schooled restart and slacker and they're highly motivated books that students would want to read we try to look for different main characters so that it's not always because um, the last few books that we've had all school books seem to be a female character that we have had so we tried to vary that up grade seven and eight um, and so what the teachers do is it is to read and, and just do a quick little log here's a page number here's the best quote I liked and why mm -hmm. but they actually do a lot of projects with them back when school starts so the majority of what we want them to do is just to really just read the book over the summer. Um, same thing with seventh and eighth grade, they do projects. Um, seventh and eighth grade wanted to keep all of the same books, um, but we did switch out one in grade seven. So last year we had for grade seven, Esperanza Rising and Chains, um, and then we wanted to add Refugee. So Refugee is from three characters' points of view, and where they were refugees, one is from um, it's three different time frames as well. One is a refugee from during World War II. One is going from Cuba trying to get to the United States, and one is also um, try, uh, leaving Somalia and going into Europe as a refugee. So you get three different character point of view. Eighth grade is A Night Divided um, by Jennifer A. Nielsen, The Running Dream by Wendelin Van Drain, which is actually a book that's written that she wrote after the Boston Marathon bombing. Um, and The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind is actually a memoir from, um, that's by William Kim Kawambi, that's set in Africa. Um, so each grade for the summer reading has simple quotes. Um, and then what's important, what's a connection? Seventh grade is just really a think along a quick summary, mental pictures, visualization, and making questions, predictions, connections, expressing, expressing opinions. And then in eighth grade, um, again, they're having a quote, what is one of the main character's traits and what's a quote that goes along with that trait. And then for the summer math, the math teachers, that is a quick 40 problems or less quick review of what they should know before from last year before coming into the next grade just to review and they're going to get it as a packet or it's online they'll get a copy at the end of the year but it will be online so why i make it as a full web a page on our school web page so it's already already there it's just hidden and i'll make it viewable once it's passed out everything will go out to the sixth grade when they come up for step up day for the teachers to pass out and the seventh and eighth grade the teachers asked today to pass those out on june 7th so that it doesn't get lost in all the end of the year stuff i would just make the recommendation of attaching a copy of the books here so that parents don't have to go two places okay um yeah. and maybe even just a cover page with the sixth grade books seventh grade books eighth grade books so that because they are going to do just what we did and say, okay, well, what are we reading? And, and they may not know to go to the website. Yeah, that's not, that's not a problem. The, web, the website is nicer, though, because I put all the pictures up so you can <laughs> see what the books look yeah, like. Yeah, <laughs> I, I just find there are some people who are online and, and, yeah. and are willing to search. And, and based on some of the questions I see out there, like, does anybody know the school calendar? They know where to, they, they just don't want to find anything. So I think, <laughs> I think you need to or they're give busy. it to them. Or they're busy and they just want it to be an easy. Easy. Yeah, easy. yeah. Hand it to them. But I think, yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Definitely easy. Yeah. Manageable. You know, like. Sorry, I did have one more thing. They are being all made into bookmarks again as well. So oh, the bookmark will have the have three the books, books that oh, go okay. with this. But I don't have them yet because uh, the print shop at, B at BMR High School is making them. Oh, oh, there okay. you go. Cool. Mikey, a minute and a half. <laughs> yeah. Or less. We have three titles. That's okay. Go. We ready? Go. We ready? Yes, go. So, one, we, we don't have any bookmarks for our kids. I'm sorry. <laughs> our math assignment, we're doing five assist, assistment projects that are, will be um, towards the 
the the math class that they're in. Right. There's a Google um, Google access code for teachers Google to get, or, or a Google Classroom code for students to get into. Uh, we will post many more assessment projects, assignments, if students choose to choose to do that. But we're looking at that as a math review in preparation for the following following year. In terms of our reading, um, we are excited to continue to do a one school, one theme. Uh, we have three books that um, a committee chose. Uh, the Hate You Give, Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, and I Am Alala. We're looking at the theme of problem solving and overcoming challenges. So we believe that we that when we learn how to appropriately overcome challenges and become problem solvers, our community becomes stronger. And that's going to be aligned to 9-11 um, and a community day that we'll have at the high school. And um, we're excited to also say that it'll be aligned to our instructional focus of problem solving. Um, so that is the summer reading. Um, students will be asked to read the book, understand the plot, the theme, and be prepared for various activities throughout the school um, and the English department, uh, along with possibly developing a community service um, project proposal um, for next year. So, but the community day uh, went extremely well. Mm -hmm. Kids want to continue and do more with community-based projects, uh, experiential learning, and so forth. So um, I think that the books are current. Um, they are looking at overcoming challenges in, in various ways. And I think that's something that we're looking to do with our students in terms of uh, problem solving across the board from an SEL standpoint and just a content-based standpoint. So that was my two minutes. Thank we'll you very much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks gentlemen. And then just uh, just quick on the budget. Uh, hmm. Okay. So I just you wanted this, Jane. what you I do. All your numbers. I got <laughs> the numbers. I think I know the numbers. I you know them now too. You got them. You were good. Thank you. <laughs> so I just wanted to let people know that um, we have. Um, had many meetings and a lot of work, um, particularly by our superintendent and assistant superintendent. Uh, I met with the Blackstone Board of Selectmen yesterday who have um, begun to understand um, our process and our needs for our district. I think they always have. They've always been supportive of the district, but I think they were shocked based on focusing on particular numbers and not the whole picture. Um, and I think the picture was described very clearly and I think they were very supportive of where the district is trying to go. And so they have indicated to us and in their public meeting last night that they, their plan is to make an amendment and support the certified budget of the school district. Uh, and they will do so on the floor. But in order to do so, they need to shift their budget um, priorities around. And so they will make an amendment to move um, warrant item number 23, which is the ability for the town of Blackstone to borrow uh, money, they will move that prior to the discussion on um, budget items, the omnibus budget, uh, which is warrant item number three. And so um, should that be approved, then the funds will be available to support the full certified budget uh, of the school committee. So the Board of Selectmen will move um, the school uh, line item budget and increase it back to the original certified amount that we had here or, or um, recommend putting back the $298,000 that was recommended uh, removed from the budget. So uh, they need to do that. They will also move um, changing the DPW budget um, to lease a truck as opposed to purchasing a truck which will also free up funds um, and so if line 23 um, is approved uh, or warrant item number 23 is approved and uh, our certified budget is approved and the DT 
DPW lease is approved, then they will waive the reading of items 18, 24, 25, and 26 because they will be covered under uh, the passing of line 23. So it is very important to us as a school district to see uh, citizens from the town of Blackstone uh, at the meeting on the 28th of May. Uh, at 7 p.m. for the special town meeting, 7.30 p.m. for the annual town meeting in the high school auditorium, uh, and hopefully support the town, and in supporting the town, will ultimately support the school district, which I think we have said we are a district of one and we need that support. So we hopefully uh, will see people out there to support the town and support the school, and hopefully after... Um, May 28th at about maybe 9 p.m. or ish, we will have a certified school budget and um, uh, Dr. DeFalco and Mr. Aaronworth will be able to get a good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Jane, I just want to add, uh, first I'd like to thank Mr. Dudek and the Student Council and the National Honor Society. I, I do want to make everyone aware that there will be child care available at that meeting. Thank you. You know what time? It's going to open up. Six forty-five. Did we say? Our students are coming at six forty-five. Yeah, okay. Six forty-five yeah. to nine o'clock. So we need to be done by nine. <laughs> On it. On it. Mm -hmm. In and out. Question. I'm not excusing those absences. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jeff. No, oh, I said move the question. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. Okay. Is that it? That concludes my report. Okay. Uh, our next meeting is June. I thought we were the 13th. 12th? June 13th. June 13th. Yes, June 13th. Yep. Uh, and does anybody have anything? I'm not going to go around. Okay. We do have an executive session, so I'll entertain a motion to enter executive session, not to return and to adjourn there, not to return to this meeting. And we need to do that by roll call. So, so moved. Moved by second. Sarah, second by Tammy. Wendy. Wendy. I don't know. Yes. Am I looking this way? <laughs> yes. 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 Chair, do we have a quorum? Oh, we do not. We do not. No. <laughs> Does that mean we Motion have to stay to in this meeting yeah. until someone comes? <laughs> 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 we can, can we can adjourn. We can adjourn <laughs> without a quorum. So can we can adjourn. We make a motion adjourn. to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the yeah. Uh, so no adjourned. No executive session.